Will Pope John Paul II be forced to resign? Opposing forces battle for power over pivotal issues. Will there be a Mr. and Mrs. Pope? Will women be ordained Catholic priests? Are traditional Christians on the way back to the catacombs? Will homosexual marriages be sanctioned? The long-running covert warfare against Pope John Paul II, led by powerful members of his own hierarchy, including cardinals and bishops in Rome, in the U.S. and around the world, has broken into the open over the past five months. It's going to end within the next 12. The prize is control of one of the world's most powerful positions. So predicts former Vatican insider and best-selling author Dr. Malachi Martin. In his latest national bestseller, Windswept House, it's a double-day book, already recognized as, quote, one of the most powerful books of the decade, end quote. As in his earlier bestsellers, uh, Vatican and the Final Conclave, Father Martin again draws aside the thick veil of secrecy that surrounds the world's oldest political power and vast financial empire known as the Vatican. This time he unveils a deadly global war, a winner-take-all campaign aimed at the target of targets control of the power cockpit of the world, a war for control of the papacy itself as a nerve center of the only up-and-running, self-sustaining, worldwide governing structure. And this evening, I think what I'm going to do is let um, uh, Dr. Uh, Martin uh, speak for himself. But before he does, Doctor, welcome to the program. Um, how would you prefer to be addressed, uh, Malachi, Dr. Martin, Father uh, Martin? I think uh, under the circumstances, seeing that uh, I'm known to you and you're known to me and your listeners, I think I'd better be called Malachi Martin. Everybody knows that I'm a Roman Catholic priest. A practicing one, and that I have several doctorates, and let's not emphasize either aspect. Just call me by my name, Malachi Martin. Malachi, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Art. It's such a pleasure and an honor. And, and it, it is to have you as well. Uh, let me tell you, after the last program we did, yeah. uh, I, I don't want to say all hell broke loose. Uh, that, uh -huh. I guess yes, uh, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> that would be in context to all right, but I know what you mean. It's, it's, make it the wrong impression. Uh, it may. Might we uh, have you, for the audience, describe sure. your own background? Yes, my own background is this, that I was born 76 years ago in a remote corner of Kerry Island uh, on, the, on, the, on the Atlantic in a stone house. And um, I was educated in Dublin. And then I entered the Jesuit order. I became a Jesuit in 1939 on the eve of the war. And I was a Jesuit until 1964. And in the meantime, I did special studies. I was trained as an expert in Semitic languages, Oriental art and uh, archaeology, and in um, anthropology and theology, uh, and getting doctorates out of all that sort of thing. And uh, I ended up as an expert, uh, uh, first of all, uh, on, on Middle East questions, and gradually, I was co-opted into helping uh, a pope called John the Twenty-Third, the Roly Poly Pope, <laughs> uh, Angelo Roncalli, as he was called, mm -hmm. and then his successor, Paul the Sixth, uh, who died in 1978, to be succeeded by John Paul II, uh, with an interim pope of 34 days old, John Paul I. I, um, but in the year 1963, 64, I went to Paul VI, whom I knew very well, and asked him for permission to leave the Jesuits, uh, to keep my vow of celibacy, but to forsake my vow of poverty so I could earn my own living, and uh, uh, also forsake my vow of obedience so that I wouldn't have to obey people whose policies I did not like and whose theology I suspected. Uh, not being uh, orthodox enough for my mind anyway, whatever, because one must finally rely on one's own judgment, because you'll only be ju you'll be judged only on your own judgment, not on what anybody else says. And I came to New York in that year, 1965, and I've been here ever since, for my sins and my happiness. <laughs> I became an American citizen, the ritual time, five years later. 
Well, I hope it has been uh, well for you. Are you comfortable with the decisions that you have made in your life? I, this isn't their work. I can't call you Malachi. That's somebody with this many doctorates. I'm going to have to call you doctor. So I guess uh-huh. I'll have to live. Really, if I, ought, I should call you Doctor Ash. <laughs> no, 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 no doctorates. <laughs> um, any, anyway, Doctor, uh, are you are you pleased with the decisions that you have made in your life? Would you change any? No, no. Life has been good to me. God has been good to me. No, no, I, I would not. I would leave it as it is. I might change a little thing here. You know, when you look at the old machine, you change a nut and put a little oil into this crank and uh, polish up that little flywheel. And that, but the, the overall machinery has served its purpose, I think, in my human judgment. God right. be my judge. All right. Well, um, I have a lot of new listeners uh, in Chicago, and uh, sadly in Chicago, uh, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine has passed away. Yes. And I was wondering if you uh, knew uh, the Cardinal, uh, if you ever met him, and if you had anything to say to those folks in Chicago who surely are going to miss him. Well, I'll tell you, the, the all, all death is sort of a symbol of human defeat. You know, a life ends, and this end, life ended rather abruptly. We, we did know that the Cardinal was ill for quite a while, and... Uh, I think they said pancreatic cancer right. uh, are the ultimate identified cause. Uh, but uh, it, it was a, a quick end because we did not expect it to be so sudden. And as in many cases like that, it's overnight almost that he disappears into the cold of eternity, as the French uh, says. Uh, le froid éternel into the cold eternal, although eternity itself needn't be so cold at all that if it's lit up by the love of God and uh, or the fires of hell, <laughs> whichever really one ends up with. Uh, it, so it's always a defeat. It's always a sense of uh, loss, and that's what it is. Carl Bernardine was a very distinguished cleric. Uh, he he uh, comes from came from South Carolina, and he ended up in the most populous and important uh, Roman Catholic uh, community they, of Chicago. Uh, in his in his final apotheosis, in his final development, um, he is missed because of the central position he occupied, yes. uh, and that position should be summed up, frankly and honestly, as being the man in charge of a huge machine. Many thought that he might have been the first American pope. Yes, he he himself indeed would like to have been pope, and in the last big public. Uh, statement of his, uh, which amazed a lot of people, and which we'll describe briefly in a moment, uh, he sounded a papal note. That was a press conference and declaration he held uh, in uh, a couple of weeks ago only, in which he uh, proposed that Catholics should seek a new ground of unity, as he called it. And this was astounding, Art, because the, for Catholics, traditionally, since the time of the Emperor Constantine, the ground for unity has always been the papacy itself, mm-hmm. the leader. And this time, Cardinal Bernin was stepping out. And uh, his fellow cardinals in the United States, especially Cardinal Law of Boston and uh, O'Connor of uh, New York, and uh, the man in, 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 in uh, Philadelphia, the cardinal there, they disagreed with what he said because they recognized immediately the papal conclave character of that statement. What what Bernadine was doing that day was stating what he thought the church should become. Uh It was a papal speech. And um, I think that by that time he knew that he was doomed to die soon. But still and all, he made a pitch for it because he did belong uh, and was the leader of a faction amongst the cardinals, which is a very powerful faction. And that faction would rather diminish the importance of the papacy completely and make it much more uh, an affair of uh, a consensus amongst the great cardinals and bishops of the church. So that was his contribution to it, and it stirred a lot of ire in Rome and it stirred a lot of controversy here. Now, then, as regards his achievement as such, one cannot say that Catholicism flourished during his reign as Cardinal Archbishop of, of, uh, of Chicago. Uh, only one out of every six Catholics goes to Mass in Chicago. Hmm. How does that compare to the national number? Uh, that compares rather badly with the national number. 
uh, it's not as bad as that. And then several churches were closed in his time. Uh, Catholicism as a, as, a, as a mode of devotion uh, to God and to Christ and to the angels and saints, and, uh, with the, which is the essence of Catholicism, did not flourish under Cardinal Bernadine. We can't fool ourselves that it did. But he was a great public leader in the sense that he took a lead and he managed very carefully and skillfully with a, almost uh, an extraordinary touch. He managed the that very powerful body of men, 280, 280 of them, called the American Bishops or the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, the NCCB, with its political arm, uh, the uh, NCCC. That's the, 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 uh, it's, it's the political uh, arm of the bishops in America. He managed that. And he also, during his time, he forced the hand of John Paul II in several points. And he forced them by using skillfully the Vatican's dependence on American money, American contributions from the bishops, mm -hmm. to keep the Vatican out of the red. So, even for the Vatican money talks? Oh, I think right up to the doors of hell, money talks. I God, see. To be awfully frank with you. In the last two days of his life, yes. he wrote to the um, United States Supreme Court, yes. urging it not to allow doctor-assisted suicide. Yes, he did. He did. And in that, he was joined by hundreds of organizations, and that's our business, uh, 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 proposing the same thing. And uh, by the way, the Clinton administration itself has decided and sh uh, declared that it itself it, it discourages the idea of any, any action on the part of the Supreme Court of the United States favoring uh, a, a doctor-assisted suicide. How would you, um, doctor, argue against somebody who would say, look, I'm in the last stages of a horrible disease. I'm racked by pain. My life is no longer um, functional mm -hmm. uh, in any way that I can measure or want to measure, and I wish not to suffer out these last few days and wish to take my own life or have somebody assist me in that process, whatever the case may be. In other words, the argument of it's my life, whose life is it anyway? Yes. The, the, the main... the, the the difficulty in answering a question like that, which is easy, is to be answered finally, in all honesty, is that it, this cannot be regarded uh, isolatedly as a personal problem, uh, because uh, unless one is totally an atheist uh, and one does not believe in any sense that God has any right or just has a say in anything or that God even exists. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is also uh, that uh, what it would open up by way, uh, and even the, the American government, uh, in its comments uh, to the Supreme Court, uh, is of that opinion, and Bernadine was too, and most of the organizations, hundreds of them that have uh, co communicated with the Supreme Court, say the same thing, it opens a Pandora's box. And finally, there's this fact about it, uh, that you can nowadays, within the limits of medical practice and medical ethics, you can obtain palliatives for your pain. Uh, which will diminish the stress of it all. Yes. Uh, and they, I've always understood them, Art, I may be wrong, I've always understood it, that those palliatives, those drugs used to diminish pain, gradually reduce vitality. And don't, it don't exactly hasten death, but they don't promote life either. But they do, by diminishing pain, uh, they bring you closer uh, in a more comfortable way. And finally, they, you see, for a Christian art, it's a terribly important thing that any d drop, any moment of human suffering has an eternal value in the light of the sufferings of the man-god on his cross yes. in, on Calvary. And that, I know, is a hard doctrine, but because Christians believe they're here to prepare for heaven, not to establish a paradise on earth, and if the paradise... Uh, ceased and then they can wipe themselves out. Uh, but that, uh, earth, uh, life on earth is a preparation. It's a hard doctrine. I know it's a hard doctrine. So that pain, that pain is part of what we are here to experience. That's right. If I have pain, if I have a toothache, if I have a breech birth with a child, mm -hmm. if I lose a child, if I have arthritis, if I get uh, a disease, it, it can be and should be uh, used to merge with the sufferings, the meritorious sufferings of uh, Jesus Christ. 
That's the basic Christian doctrine. For those who are not Christian, I know it's not much consolation, but it still operates on, on their, in their case. Well, I'm afraid it makes sense. Doctors, stand by. We're at the bottom of the hour, and we'll be right back. ...of their transsexuality or the transsexual operation. Uh, they are not... They, in no way can you say that that signifies ipso facto possession exactly. at all. That's mm -hmm. an illusion. Um... With regard to transsexuality, homosexuality, yes. uh, what advice do you give if somebody comes to you and says, uh, uh, Father, I'm a, I'm a homosexual, yes. uh, I'm struggling with myself, I don't yes. like uh, what I am and what I'm doing, but I'm driven and I can't stop, how do you yes. advise, what do you say? Uh, if I have the, uh, the occasion and the time, and the convenience, it's all a matter of convenience. If they're calling from, say, uh, Anchorage, Alaska, it's one thing. If they're calling from 64th and Madison Avenue in New York, it's something else, of course. It's <laughs> near where I live out, you know. Yes. But depending on those ordinary human factors, which sometimes determine our fate, depending on those, uh, there is a spiritual treatment, spiritual, um, not therapy, it's the wrong word to use, it's a spiritual treatment which can resolve uh, peacefully and successfully the struggle one has with one's sexuality, homosexuality or heterosexuality, or transsexuality for that matter. Uh, but that's a very delicate spiritual operation that must be done with authority and skill. But it can be done. It's not an irreparable uh, and unchangeable situation. No, it, it's possible. But uh, the one thing, the one thing that the person involved must get into their mind is, it's not a therapy. It's not the work of a therapist as such. It doesn't rely on psychological or psychophysical uh, factors, although it treats those factors because they're involved in all sexuality. Oh, isn't that interesting? So it's not psychotherapy and it's not an exorcism. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's a spiritual treatment. See, but it, it, I don't want to be plunging into a description of it, which could take us the whole of our five or six hours together today. Ask. <laughs> it really could. But uh, if we have that much time. But there, I don't think you require that or the questioner requires that. But no, there's more than hope. There's concrete, there are concrete steps to be taken. But as I say, it's a, it's a treatment. It takes time and money and uh, take convenience of location. You understand me? Yes, of course I do. Of course I do. So um, it's not an impossible situation at all. But the nature, then the nature of the treatment is of a spiritual understanding? On, on the... uh, that's right. It's a spiritual understanding, but it's also this, that there is no doubt in my mind at all as a priest. And now I've been priesting since 1954 steadily. Before that, I was in training. Um, there's no doubt about it. There is aid, help. There is aid, succor in the shape of what is called in Christian theology the grace of God, the special supernatural help which does repair uh, any damage that our faculties have suffered through living. And our faculties do suffer, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the way we live and what is done to us, you know, if I'm weird by, I say, a father who is a, a drug addict and a mother who is a lush, I'm going to be damaged. Uh, That's correct, yes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, anything like that can be repaired, but the chief factor of doing that is a special help from God called grace. It's supernatural. It's not a dimension. It's not something you put in your pocket. It's not something you measure. But, boy, is it powerful. Mm -hmm. um, it's right. On to another question. Uh, on the last program, yes. you said during the next three, three and a half years or so, mm -hmm. keep your eye your eyes to the sky. Yes. That something, and, and Doctor, I must tell you, uh, with the program I did last night, yes. uh, with so many other programs, yes. uh, with the remote viewers, all these yes. different people, yes. Yes. Uh, American natives, yes. they're all saying roughly the same thing. Something's coming. Something big. Yes, something's a super... coming. About that sums it up. Our, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sums up our mentality. And you know, if I could break into you, of course, it's, that betrays my Irish blood. We Irish are always interrupting each other. Quite all right. To, to improve uh, for the, the person who's saying, um, if I could say this much to you, no matter what, along the entire...
spectrum of belief from a fuddy-duddy Roman Catholic priest like me over to something radically different, uh, radically different in belief. There's a common sensation today yes. that we are passing through a window, as people have the expression, from one era, from one condition, human condition, to another condition. And half of our confusion and our squabbling and our impatience today uh, and our fears, above all our fears are, because fear is a very dominant factor today oh, yes. in public and private life and personal life, that is due to the fact that we all sense, uh, uh, without being able to pin it down authoritatively, that we are indeed passing through a window of opportunity. A kind of quickening is going on. Yes, there is a thing going on, and it, uh, it, it cannot be laughed at. I remember Freud in 1938, publishing a statement in Vienna. I followed it because my daddy was a doctor, and I was a young man of 17, but I was engrossed in studies like this. And he's saying that, why is it? He said it at one of these psychoanalytic meetings that was held in, in Vienna, just pre-war Vienna. And by that time, Vienna was under the, 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 the grip of Hitler with the Anschluss um, and the Nazis. Why is it, he said, that the majority of you, addressing his, his fellow psychiatrists, are reporting that a vast majority of your patients are tortured by dreams of barbed wire mm -hmm. and bloody bodies. Why? Why now? And of course, they knew nothing about the, the horrible things that were going to be transpire for the next five or six years. But the, there is a, and it does go back to something which was true about Carl Jung. I don't like Carl Jung at all. I don't like his personal life, and I don't like his theories. But he did talk about this sort of uh, universal consciousness. Yes. And, uh, of course, he made it into something else. Uh, like a lot of other people, having found something valuable in nature, he proceeded to imagine what it was, and that was not scientific. And he went beyond the data. But there is, there is a consciousness amongst us all, in spite of our differences, uh, due to everything, from sex to color to shape to race to education, uh, that there is something big taking place. We, uh, the phrase is, we're passing through a window of opportunity. Into what we do not know, and that is confusing, because the old world, the one we knew, has passed away. There's no doubt about it. We're constructing something, or something is being constructed of us, of us, of us. We're the living stones in this new temple. I, I felt as though we're past the point of no return. That doesn't mean the end of everything. It just means we're going to go on to whatever is next. That's right. We can't go back. There's no going back. Uh, and we know that. And that's confusing, first of all, because, you know, there are two things that are very frightening for a human being. The first is to be in a land he doesn't or she doesn't know. It's totally alien. Yes. But one of the most uh, disturbing things is to be, is to be persuaded that there's an alien being you don't know now in your presence or in your area. I would do it. It's very disturbing because that arouses up the good old territorial uh, imperative, as, as, as Robert Audrey used to call it, but it also arouses up this fear of the alien. We don't like what is alien. We must know it. Could uh, what is coming, uh, Doctor, be spiritual? In other words, something that will affect... All of us. Art, actually, you know, and you, 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 you've got a source of information that most people haven't got with your marvelous syndication and your own intelligence. There's no doubt about it. We all know that the big change we sense and are afraid of in that sense, because we don't know what it is, is in our spirit, mm -hmm. in our human spirit as such. We know there are forces molding it, shaping it, as the consensus of a race of people, and not merely as uh, five billion different conscious, consciousnesses. You understand me? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. Uh, that the, the change is in our spirit. There's a change being operated. And sometimes we like the results, and sometimes we don't like it. But we know it's in spirit. And by spirit, we mean something other than my flesh. The, the skin on my hand and the color of my face and the length of my hair and the timbre of my voice and the look in my eye uh, and the way I walk and what I do. There's something else. We, we are something else. We are a soul. We are a spirit. 
and that is being molded willy-nilly. Well, I, I certainly believe that. Um, I, I wonder if I can ask you a sensitive question. Sure. Uh, being a man of God, um, have you ever, have you ever, Father, doubted yourself? Um, first of all, I'm a man of God in the sense that I'm supposed to be devoted to God's glory. I, I'm a sinner like everybody else, uh, but I do belong to God by avocation, by formal uh, profession. Right. Uh, I have never yet doubted the divinity of Jesus. I've never doubted the existence of heaven and of hell and of purgatory. I've never doubted the value of his cross to solve life's problems. I've never doubted the creation of the world by God. No, I've never doubted that. Um, what I have had uh, by way of difficulties were the governing of my own passions and my own fears, above all my fears. Because I, I remember my grandfather saying to me, if I could be personal, he said once when I expressed some fears, I was about 18 at that time, and about to leave home forever and not go back, he said, measure your love of God by the quantum, I use that word, the quantum of fear in your heart. And uh, it's been a lesson all my life. And I've been dealing with fears that anybody has. Um, should people... Fear God. And respect is in the sense of fear. There's, there are two kinds of fear, Art. Let's distinguish them very carefully. There's the general fear which is, has a little note of panic in it. Mm. Uh, and that is something you have to eradicate because that produces confusion and errors in judgment and mistakes and therefore failure. And it's painful in a very deep sense. And it isn't, doesn't make you more cautious. It makes you stupid because you make mistakes if you're afraid. It's self-control in that sense is necessary. There is a fear, though, of God, which is respect for him. He did make us from nothing according to our beliefs. Uh, but again, in all this, I'm a, I'm a Christian and a Catholic, so you forgive it when it's biased or not biased, but it's, it's one-sided. There's no doubt about that. It's the Christian point of view. But it's just that, that he, he, we do depend on him. And if, or if, if it comes to the point of my rebellion against him for the sake of my own passions, for the sake of my own ambitions, for the sake of my own uh, hates and desires, he can deal out, dole out to me a punishment beyond belief, beyond imagining, and that for all eternity. And that, <laughs> that's a very healthy <laughs> balance sometimes in life when uh, life does, extend to you something which looks terribly enticing. Yes. It, uh, it does, it introduces a balance. Uh, not always listened to when you're 20 and 30, but when you hit 40, 50, 60, 70 and face the 80s, you suddenly realize that there is a Lord of life and he finally is the Lord of everything. So that's sort of a fear, yes, but not craven fear, Michael. Uh, uh, Art, not craven fear. Um, all right. Uh, Father, um the Pope recently said, surprisingly, shockingly, for a lot of Catholics, oh. and not for some, that evolution is more than just a theory. Mm -hmm. uh, seeming to affirm uh, the process of evolution, and that was quite a shock for many. Mm -hmm. were, you, were you surprised? Not a bit, in my knowledge of the Holy Father, knowing what he is. Now, we, we better be very clear about this. This is a personal opinion of the Pope. It's not in any way connected with belief. Uh, he is, for various political as well as ideological reasons, in favor of regarding uh, the, 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 I want to call it what I think it is, the metaphysical myth of evolution regarding it as a serious hypothesis. <laughs> the reason I regard it as a metaphysical myth is this, that we know that we have now reached the end of the fossil record. We know that. There's no other fossil record to search any longer. And in that fossil record, uh, since the time of Charles Darwin in 1850, we have not found one, but not one sign of evolution from the point of view of a missing link, linking phylum to phylum, uh, primate to primate. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. And now we know it doesn't exist. Uh, so evolution is, is a nice myth because it explains things, hmm. but when you look for, as a scientist, for the proof of it, concrete proof, there ain't no proof, sir. 
that specifically. So the Pope has made of his own an opinion like that, but he has a political reason as well as an ideological reason for making that statement. What is the political reason? Political reason is that the more powerful cardinals in his Roman court, his Roman, uh, uh, in his Vatican, mm -hmm. and the more powerful uh, academicians in his church, whom he has fomented, by the way, they are all evolutionists. And therefore, he wants to play it very safe with them. He does belong to what is called, a bit too long to explain like this, unless you want to dump, which we can do. He belongs himself to the French school of thought in this matter. He's very sympathetic. By the way, Poland has always been sympathetic with France and France with Poland on account of the help that France gave to Poland yes. while it was in the grip of Russia or Prussia or Germany. That's past history. I mean, Chopin yes. is, is the example of that. Indeed. There was great connection between Paris and Warsaw always. And the French school of thought, which is a very, very brilliant school of thought in the, in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, has a huge influence on Polish intellectuals. And the Pope is a creature of that, intellectually. He's not a Thomist, if you know what that is. Well, He's not a follower of Thomas Aquinas. He's a French intellectual. We all wish to think of the Pope as a spiritual leader and yes. in, in that context. But in fact, the Pope is probably as much of a political leader as spiritual, is he not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh -huh. You see, this poor man, I say that with great, uh, with great sympathy for him, he has to deal with the geopolitics of faith. That is the fact that the nations of the earth are the children of God and are supposedly, uh, theoretically, in the Catholicism, they're under the mandate of Christ's salvation. At the same time, he has to deal with the geopolitics of reason, the faith of nations. Yes. And he did that, for instance, in Poland, where he did, he was the instrument with Ronnie Reagan's government mainly, he was the instrument of making the first breach in the wall of the Soviet Union, which led finally to its dismemberment, and, yes. and uh, the, uh, the rest is history. So he, he has that double function, and his agony, actually, it, was a, it has been a real agony. Uh, his agony has been the balancing of those two forms of geopolitics. How does anybody, including the Pope, hmm. uh, indulge the, the, the politics he must without sinning? Art, that is such a profound question. <laughs> and, and no, it says, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to butter you up or, or, or flatter you. It's such a profound question because, look, you know, in your ordinary life, passions come in. You can't be reasonable, follow reason all the time. Your passions come in. Your prejudices, your right. former biases, That's right. uh, the people that were nice to you and the people you loved, and then the people who were unnice to you and that you didn't like or perhaps hated sometimes. Mm. And then you've got national and ethnic and cultural prejudices. All that comes in. And any deviation from reason, any deviation from justice, divine and human, is wrong, is a sin in itself. can be forgiven. God will forgive all these things and cleanse them all by the blood of Jesus. But... It's the fact that we do err, and the Pope, sitting where he does, is more easily guilty of malfeasance in high office than I ever will be, because I was never Pope and never will be. <laughs> so your answer is, he can't. He can't avoid it. He can't avoid it. You know, all he can do is, he can rely on the blood of Christ and the forgiveness of Jesus. Forgiveness. Yes, yeah. there is always that. Uh, uh, but always but that the, the very process of politics, the very process itself, necessitates compromise. That's right, it does. Exactly. That's where the difficulty arises. That's exactly where the difficulty arises. And sometimes both the present Pope and his, his big mentor, Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski, who's now dead, who is called the Fox of Europe, and who drew circles around the Soviets in his day, by the way, <laughs> and they never caught him. They tried to do anything to him, to him kill him. But he and uh, the present Pope, as cardinals in Poland long before he became Pope, um, had to make compromises with the Marxists. Otherwise, they couldn't have survived. That must have been a very sad personal time for the Pope. It, it was dreadful, yes, it was. And it was dangerous, and it seared his soul, and it left an indelible mark. Mark, I, I, I have always wondered all my life, which are deeper? Uh, the wounds of reality that scar my body and my mind, or the deeper wounds to my very being from my own errors and sins.
I imagine, I imagine we wonder about these things uh, all the time we are on this earth. I imagine if we are humble at all, if we are realistic and uh, stop having uh, too many <laughs> illusions. Uh, I suppose the great thing is not to be... Uh, Do Doctor, I've got to I've show you there. We'll be right back, and when we come back, Major Dames. To the matter at hand, uh, my guest, Dr. Malachi Martin. Uh, doctor, welcome back. Thank you very much, Art. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, it is a pleasure. It is, it is indeed. And uh, you did say, did you not, uh, Doctor, that um, remote viewing, you thought, was nitroglycerin for the soul? Yes, understood in that sense. Yes, I did regard it as nitroglycerin for the soul in the sense that uh, it, has, uh, uh, it has the potential for a powerful explosion in the human soul. All right. Uh, with that in mind... Uh, here is a man who did remote viewing for the U.S. military and now does it uh, in civilian life uh, for a company, his company, called SciTech. And he has been a guest on this program many times. Here is Major Ed Dames. Major, welcome to the program. Hello, Art. And Father Martin, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Major, you have no idea. I've looked forward to this very much. Uh, uh, what the Art made me his complete slave by promising that I would be able to talk. Huh? <laughs> he yeah, really did. Uh, two of us, I hope you have the same key for the ball uh, around our foot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have. Well, tell me this. Um, I feel like follow my leader in this matter because uh, I'm purely and simply a, a, a non-technician as regards psychiatry or psychology or therapy or anything like that. I'd like to share some of my own experiences. I'd like to do the, that. Uh, the area <clears throat> of remote viewing and spirituality. Yes. I, uh, be, let me give you just a little background about myself as sure. a military officer and later on if you have any questions about uh, my uh, religious backgrounds, we can get yes, into sure. But <clears throat> uh, I was the, both the operations and the training officer for these techniques that are referred to as remote viewing. My company refers to them as technical remote viewing, which are a very uh, precise way of extracting details about a, a target, a, a person, place, thing, or event. And I essentially civilianized uh, the company. I took the best members of the military team and now employ them as consultants in my company. And I teach civilians how to do this. And uh, so it's now my vocation. Uh, we work as a team against uh, uh, very significant types of targets. For instance, uh, the FBI's Unabomber or the TWA Flight 800 disaster yes. to attempt to pinpoint the locations of people and things in that regard. Yes. Uh, when these techniques were first used within the Pentagon, they were construed by many uh, senior officers to be associated with the occult, as you might guess, uh, yeah. and, and probably have heard about. My mentor lives uh, in, in uh, New York City, Ingo Swan, and uh, you may or may not have uh, ever met him. No, not many, but I've heard about him. He himself wondered when he discovered the breakthrough techniques that we used <clears throat> prior to the techniques that we use, only natural psychics, very gifted individuals could be utilized for military intelligence collection missions prior to his breakthrough. <clears throat> but he himself, when he developed these techniques, wondered, wondered aloud to me whether or not these were uh, associated with something that was dark or the shadow. He, wa he himself was concerned about this. He was concerned. He was concerned, yes. And so that was the beginning of my concerns uh, also. Yes. And uh, we were a human use team. And there was a, was a board that watched, uh, ostensibly watched us to see if there would be any deleterious effects on our yes. Uh, yes. psyches yes. during the use and the application of these techniques. It was an experimental team. <laughs> Well, the board was not that effective, and in fact, uh, what, what happened was we found that in cases where individuals were already mentally unbalanced, uh, we did run into some serious problems. Yeah. We still experience that today. You still experience that today? Yes, yes we do. If, if I attempt to teach someone how to open one's mind up, I'll use yes. a, a loose, loose term. Yes. Then, and they are not a balanced individually, emotionally or mentally stable, we yes. do run into serious problems. Yes. And if, if that is if, if partially what you are alluding to as nitroglycerin for the soul, yes. then, then you are correct in that regard. 
Yes. However, for individuals that are balanced, yes. they can uh, perceive many, many things, including turning this, this light onto the very deepest, darkest, scariest aspect of all, their own mind. Mm -hmm. And if, they're, if, if, if they have the courage to look, they can, uh, they can achieve a great leap in spirituality. Yeah. If they choose. But, uh, to get back to the subject at hand, I, I have noticed on the part of my seniors, including a, a major general, a two-star general, yes. and a very high, uh, uh, intelligence executive, yes. that remote viewing, these techniques became replacements for religion. Yes. These were in the, uh, these were, uh, people who were uh, in their 50s and 60s who essentially were men without gods. They, it was a spiritual vacuum in their lives. And when these techniques became available to them, either as utilizers or as practitioners, yes. they completely lost their balance and perspective. Uh, uh, in what sense, uh, lose their balance and perspective? Religious? Uh, in what actually, sense? in the sense of a whole body, in both uh, mental and emotional. Oh, really? This became an, almost an end-all. It was more than a passion in their lives, the answers yeah. to all questions, yeah. uh, not only a means to an end, but an end itself. It itself. Was almost as if they felt empowered by this absolute knowledge. Yeah, and that, 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 um, that's what you refer to when you said a, a, a decrease in balance. They lost their stability. They stability, could not yeah. function in a balanced way. It was noticed by all around them. And these were people who were in positions of, of authority oh, yeah. and, res and great responsibility. And was, it, was, that, uh, was, there, was the was that imbalance to the point that they had to be relieved of their authority? That is correct. Uh -huh. They were that's relieved, important. including that's, my commanding general. Well, that's very important because, my God, without an authority, stable authority, no, no, no achievement is possible. No. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I find all that utterly fascinating, uh, Major. Let me not interrupt you. You go on, please. Well, <clears throat> I think there's some other things that, that you would like to know. <clears throat> yes. Uh, what I would like to tell you some of the things that this has done for me personally. Yes. Uh, Could, and, would you share that with me? Uh, I would be glad to. Uh, I no longer am, uh, I no longer re require, I feel I do not require faith. Yes. I'm no longer what one would call a man of faith. Yes. And that is because I don't, I don't feel that I need faith anymore. Yeah. I have absolute trust now. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, I've reached a point by looking at certain nooks and crannies yeah. spiritually with yeah. the techniques that I employ and have learned yeah. that I'm so trusting. I, it's when you can see things around you, perceive things around you mm -hmm. that are divine and demonic and put them in their places, their respective places. Yes. then there are no dark areas. The yes. darkest areas are within our own Therefore, mind. there's no need of faith, you conclude. I'm sorry? Therefore, that's, you that's, conclude there's no need for faith. That, and personally, only yes. uh, personally, Father. Of I, course, I, I, know, I know what you're saying is. And I'm, I, I, I'm quite sure that you would uh, not only take exception to that, but you could give me some good cases. No, 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 that no, take, not. no take exception, I don't, Ed. I have no sort of horror or sudden say, oh, my God. <laughs> I have no reaction like that. I'm just fascinated by it all for the moment. Well, and, and uh, some other experiences. Individuals who feel presences around them or, with, or ostensibly within them, yes. what these techniques can do, and they are difficult to, uh, to work. It takes approximately 45 minutes of pen on paper with a disciplined remote viewer to yes. gain any information whatsoever. And it takes many more uh, hours to yes. gain uh, a, a good pattern of what we are dealing with, but its yes. patterns are accurate. We're able to take that information and determine if, if, for instance, a presence is angelic, demonic, or somewhere in between, something like a diva or an ele elemental, uh, all of the various sort and sundries of both religious realities or created beings mm -hmm. and material or semi-material beings and their intents. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is a very, very useful uh, tool for a modern age where there are so, many, so much obfuscation. It's, 
uh, it can make life uh, complex, interesting, and, and but in certain regards, quite simple. And it can, can't it also solve a lot of problems that people uh, go with, which uh, people go to psychiatrists and, and psychologists? It, it can indeed. In fact, I listened to part of uh, one of your programs on Art Show, and I thought if I would if I would be with Father Martin during one of his exorcisms, yes. I could assist greatly by, by uh, using these methods and techniques, especially employed as a team, because we yes. do medical diagnostics, yes. to determine uh, whether or not you would, you would uh, of course, endorse these. This is another question, yes. endorse these techniques. But to determine what we are dealing with, whether it's a psychological trauma, the source of that trauma, was it a multiple trauma? Or was it trauma over over a long period of time? Or are we dealing with an attachment or attachments? And what are the, what is the nature of that? How affixed are they? And at what point do they depart? These are things that you already are, uh, know. You can recognize those, I'm sure. Of course. That, that would be a very interesting collaboration, Ed. It really would. It's a marvelous collaboration. It really would. Well, well itself, objectively, just without considering anything else, because there are other implications also. Uh, but anyway, let me not interrupt you. Go on, please. No, I don't have your experience in these matters, but I do have experience in discerning, in shining a light on these these the, these dark agencies, and they hate the light. They are very. They do. Uh, they do. They what do. I have found is, uh, uh, in fact, many masquerade as angelic beings or uh -huh. uh, angels of light, as Paul would call them. Uh, what, what did Paul well, Saint Paul said that uh, uh, Lucifer can transform himself into an angel of light if, in order to deceive the, the, the believer. I, I see. And uh, it's a phrase, an angel of light. In fact, when uh, in the early days, when I researched many ways that we could use uh, occult, formerly uh, uh, heretofore the appellation was the occult, occult techniques as intelligence collection yeah. tools. When yeah. I looked directly into the eyes of someone who was channeling something, you could see uh, you could see certain things, and I could see that I was being lied to. Uh, I could see uh, that I was being told everything I wanted to be told. I and then in, in subsequent <laughs> I'm laughing years, because it's so accurate. Yes, and in subsequent years, uh, uh, after learning these techniques, I was able to really gain a complete uh, appreciation for what these attachments were, the nature of them. And that became quite uh, fascinating. And uh, they are desperate to maintain that attachment, as you already uh, know. Absolutely. Know. Absolutely. I found that out as a, attempting to, to research them, research these phenomena, various occult phenomena, as intelligence collection tools, <laughs> of all things. As mm -hmm. No, no, no. no. It's a, uh, the, the connection is an obvious one to make. Uh, I can see it immediately. It's well, useful in the in field of intelligence. It, uh, we did not know. We had to, we had to uh, 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 look at that. But that exposure, that exposure to, to the knowledge, to the light of truth and awareness, um, uh, it essentially drives away many of these shadowy forces and it, uh, when people who have been, I'll say, plagued all their life by fear that there's something following me or something yes. is around me, yes. sometimes what we have found, what I have found in my work, is that thing, that sh so-called shadowy agent that has been tailing a person throughout his or her life yes. may sometimes be angelic in nature uh -huh. and not demonic. And someone has been afraid. What did you say? Yes, it uh, can be angelic, and then you add in a sentence that I didn't catch. And, and not demonic. Uh, not demonic, that's In right. some cases, the person has been afraid of something that has been a, a loving... A, 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 a benign. Cre yes, uh, well, more than benign, uh, sometimes very uh, 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 very uh, uh, loving and uh, very... Uh, uh, positively working for them. Yes. Yes, and they were very difficult, but with these techniques used correctly, and they are very difficult to use correctly. Oh, I'm sure they are. They high degrees of training. Um, and and it's, it's a delicate operation anyway. It's a delicate, but it's re uh, repeatable, and the procedures are standardized. Uh -huh. They just Great. need to use professional, their professional tools. Yeah. But that, what I wanted also to say is the connection with, with God does not go away during the process of remote viewing. One's soul is not lost. It's, if your soul is already lost or saved, uh, regardless of, 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 of using these techniques, the connection is still there, and you take it with you when you go into this 
almost a, it used to be an altered state. That was quite a different modality. But here, one simply turns their attention to some to to an idea. I'll use that roughly. So one yes. one's attention is half focused upon uh, writing down information on a piece of paper, and half focused on something. Uh, that is in, for lack of a better word, uh, one's collective unconscious. There are technical terms. Yes, yes. Let's, let's, let's stipulate we can use that phrase. It, it, it has to be defined further, uh, ultimately. But, Father, it has been the downfall of a number of people. I've seen it myself. Oh, and I know it has. And, know. and yet it's given, me, uh, it's given me more than I could possibly. It's given me answers to, to many different things. And it's allowed me, most of all, when I wanted to give back the gift, when, when I wanted to serve, I prayed for about six months to make sure I, that I knew I, I, I couldn't return the gift that I had been given of course the not. answers to all questions. Of course not. Well, I was too naive to know that. At the time I tried to return a gift, I had received dump trucks of gifts back. Yes. So I changed my strategy and just asked to serve. And, I, and what this tool allowed me to do was to precisely determine very well, it took about six months actually to make sure I was correct. Yes. How, how to serve, and how to serve my God, and that's what this tool gave me: the precise uh, uh, details of what to do, how to serve, rather than uh, just a general sense. And that's why I, uh, one of the reasons I'm so grateful to uh, to, to English one. And indeed, uh, uh, let me add in: uh, we all should be grateful that such a thing. Be because in, in theological terms, Ed, what you're talking about is a charism. It really is. It's a gift. It's uh, an ability given you. And um, uh, I still don't want to interrupt you because you have a lot more to say on this matter. Uh, I just want to add this one thing or say this one thing. And uh, it's this, that this is a very precise, well-intentioned, uh, nobly intentioned uh, effort on your part or, or, or performance. You're not doing it for self-glorification and you're not doing it for self-advantage. Uh, you primarily, you use the word serve, S-E-R-V-E, -E, which is very angelic, by the way. Um, Father, I'm going to have to interrupt. Uh, sure. and I'm going to let you continue with this uh, when we get back in a moment. From a spiritual perspective, you would think, indeed, the odd couple, but maybe not. We're going to find out. Uh, back now to Dr. Malachi Martin and uh, Major Ed Dames. And, uh, Dr. Martin, I wanted to let you finish what you had started uh, saying and then perhaps explain to us, if you would, why you think uh, remote viewing is nitroglycerin for the soul. Yes, I will. Hello, is Ed there? I, I'm here, Father Mark. All right. The um, I feel uh, I, I feel really funny. I should call you Major Ed. Ed. Oh, uh, please call me Ed. Uh, because, uh, but anyway, let's get over that for the moment. The the, uh, the original statement I made when I, with us the last time about uh, this being natural listen for the soul, because, uh, and uh, I think you you might even understand this. Uh, as I do understand this. It is if it's not done with the proper motivation and not done, as it were, scientifically, that is, with, uh, with the proper methods and checks and balances, it can disrupt uh, the soul, it can blow it up, it can cause an explosion in it. We, from my side, from the point of view of exorcists, and that's when I say we, I really mean that, those engaged in this work, uh, found that those who did remote viewing or channeling uh, without any of those uh, safeguards that you just described, um, that they underwent uh, very severe disturbances uh, uh, and disruptions of their personality, their normal persona. And they also had uh, manifestations that could only be explained uh, in the light of uh, Luciferian intervention in human things. Uh, the theory or the belief behind it uh, is that uh, there is the supernatural order and there is the natural order. The natural order is what you, what you see, the flesh and bones and blood and earth and metal around us and wood and material things. 
and then there's the supernatural order, which is the existence of God and uh, all that belongs to God. And in between, there's what we call the middle plateau. And it's on that plateau that these powers can be exercised, the powers of the soul that apparently uh, can be sharpened and uh, developed. And my language is pre-scientific and pre-medical and pre-psychiatric, Ed, and you'll appreciate that, because I don't even purport to be a psychiatrist or a therapist uh, of any kind. Um, just a negrosist and a priest. Um, now, uh, when I said to the natural listen of the soul, I meant when uh, somebody enters or tries to enter the middle plateau and deal with such powers and faculties and develop them without the proper intention or the proper controls and checks and balances. And uh, the, the phenomena that took place, that take place, that take place in people who do that are those that attract us as a group of exorcists and uh, that demand or require, from our point of view, require the attention that we bestow on it with formal exorcism as such. Now, the one more thing I want to add in just as a pabulum, as material for talk, for good discussion is this, that the difficulty is that the supernatural, as Christians conceive it, and still conceive it, is totally unimaginable. Uh, there is no human concept, uh, and therefore no human word that can describe it, um, number one. And number two, it is imperceptible to a man without a special grace from God. Uh, he can't even perceive it. So much so that if a man uh, has not got faith, he just can't imagine it. If he loses faith, uh, he, he does not know he's lost it, because if he knew he lost it, he'd have it back. The mere fact of knowing you've lost it is a perception itself belonging to faith. It's complicated as a concept, but that's the reality we have found. Now, uh, the only practical application outside of religious peace and a calm for people who come for egotism, the only practical example was, uh, strangely enough, for some army officers, uh, uh, purely as private citizens, who came for help because they had delved into the middle plateau and um, came away very disturbed. Uh, uh, then there are the normal people uh, who use Ouija boards or who use remote channeling or uh, remote viewing, and they entered an area where they were subject to terrible onslaughts from an angel of light, uh, in that technical sense of the angel of light, and the only sucker we could give them was precisely um, through these ceremonies. Uh, which are not therapies at all, because uh, necrosism is not a is not a is not a therapy. It's a confrontation. Um, that may not throw much light, but it will explain to you why I called it the natural discipline of the soul. And um, everything else is absolutely uh, uh, enlightening for me that you have said, and I presume into the hopper of all those ideas, uh, as, as the expression goes, uh, would go the entire question of the green bomb programming and um, the uh, summation that somebody like, um, uh, what's his name, Corey Hammond, uh, drew up for the American Psychiatric Association for MPD, uh, the whole idea of, uh, of the program. Uh, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I, I do. Um, just one comment. And I, I, I am uh, familiar somewhat with the, uh, with, uh, operationally with the idea of the middle plateau. Yes, yes. Um, um, channeling. There are of the more that we have found, one uh, gives up one's own identity. Mm -hmm. it, let me go back to an operational perspective again, and uh, I, I want to emphasize that this was this evolved the techniques I used as a military intelligence gathering tool, mm -hmm. and uh, that's important. It, it is when we looked at at, uh, at, the, at the phenomenon of channeling. I already mentioned some of the characteristics that uh, I, uh, behavioral characteristics that, that I observed. Um, it, be it became very evident to me operationally that channelers never took responsibility for their work or their lack of success or their lack of detail. It was always, well, it was somebody else, Manny, Mower, Jack, 
that did that, and it's not my fault that the information is incorrect. That was an interesting thing. Another, uh, the most interesting aspect was, of course, that the channeler gives up one's own identity, turns their, their, their identity over to something unknown, something that has convinced them that it's benign in most cases. That is very, very, very important. That's where the nitroglycerin aspect comes in. And uh, that is, is the essence of channeling. But technical remote viewing is, is essentially a mind tool where we are fully conscious and fully awake, even in the early days of, of the programs where uh, the natural psychics in the Army were employed for intelligence collection purposes. That was an altered state, and there were some dangers in an altered state. When we would send, I use that term loosely, yes. an, a, an officer to a remote location, there were instances where uh, in navigating that middle plateau, mm. where these people were subject to, to, to great uh, angst because they ran into other entities, so uh -huh. to speak, on the way. Uh -huh. And because, uh, and this caused uh, uh, a tremendous amount of of, uh, of grief. Uh, we 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 actually had uh, two individuals have heart attacks. Uh -huh. uh, you in, and Not employing surprising. these techniques, and of Not course, surprising. It, it's very it was very uh, uh, non-plussing to, to <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> those of us in the unit. And it so non we've settled on to these mind techniques rather than mind body techniques. Yes. And it became. Um, uh, indeed, when used correctly, and uh, they they became uh, almost a, a, a library card to essentially mm -hmm. just a, an endless amount of information. Yes. One can do with that information what one chooses to do, act exactly. in any way one chooses to do upon the information, but exactly. nevertheless it's there uh, to be downloaded. Sometimes, as in the case of at least one of my former students, and in the case of uh, a, an, another army officer who has recently authored the book, these people started to lean towards association with the very entities that they discovered in the middle plateau. Uh. And so it became a quad, they began to engage in what one could term a quasi channeling behavior. Uh -huh. Well, quasi-channeling is as good as channeling. Once you have something has of its course. hook in you, you're it's got its hook in you, and you may be uh, of course. in the shadows, but, but it's got you. That's right. And uh, that, that is why one sees, uh, 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 begins to see a, uh, a behavioral change. Uh, yeah. Frenetic, one, these individuals become frenetic, lose their balance, make statements that appear incoherent. Yeah. And as you well know, and, and that is one, that kind of behavioral change is a red flag. Something has happened. Yes, that's right. Something has happened. All right. That, have you identified what that happening was? What did happen? Or have you any? Yes, any yes, yes. We studied it, uh, uh, actually. And it, it, in, in the terms of basic psychology 101, uh, yes. the hook has been, the hook is in the individual's ego. Uh -huh. Ego has completely uh, been hooked, uh -huh. and the psyche is is the the hook is in the ego, and the psyche is being pulled along. Led it's, by it's entailed. Yep, it's entailed, as we say. Yeah. And uh, that's a very good description of uh, of the process. And we've had to study it long and hard, and use uh, a models in order to, to to discern when we're on dangerous turf. Uh -huh. And the further we cross over into giving up our own uh, decision-making ability, because that's all we really—that's all we really have—is our mind, and our mind is where we begin yeah. The, yeah. the basis for the formation of whether or not our soul survives. That's right. If we forsake that, we've forsaken the the very essence of us. I, I agree. And and when these individuals start to give up their their decision-making ability and turn their minds over to something else. I, or it become, their minds become completely imbued with ego. We lose them. Well, that's, that's the beginning of what is called, from my point of view, from my side, possession. Uh, I'm not familiar uh, that much with possession. I have only seen it once or twice in my career. I, I do want to reiterate one thing, though. The, ma we, the majority of people who come to me to learn technical remote viewing yes. Are are 
commonplace individuals that are balanced. They're, they're very interested and enthusiastic. And we can spot individuals who are, nowadays we have to because we've had so many disasters, not so many, but when the disasters occurred in the past, whether on the military team or in the case of one or two uh, civilians, yes. uh, former students, they were real disasters. Uh-huh. So that taught you a lesson. It taught us a lesson, and we have to, uh, we really scrutinize uh, the behaviors of individuals that come our way. And you have a profile of the people you wouldn't touch. It's, uh, it's not as much a profile as, a, as an art. Not as much a science as a feeling. And uh, at its art, what what would be a red flag uh, to you for somebody that you wouldn't want to deal with? Uh, frenetic behavior is one. Uh, that is that is one red flag. The uh, the individual. Uh, another thing that we see, uh, uh, if an individual just cannot uh, get away from, for instance, conspiracy theories. Uh-huh. That just uh, conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy. We we sometimes that is an indication that someone is a, uh, perhaps a paranoid schizophrenic, mm-hmm. and that's the worst case. We would absolutely never want to to, to touch to touch that to a paranoid schizophrenic. Father, uh, with what you've heard about remote viewing, yes, uh, yes. those types of personalities aside, would there be a relatively safe way to do what Ed does? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you see, he he. I mean, uh, as to sort of, uh, as his ordinary business, he laid out a, a a system of checks and balances from the point of view of intention and method and technique and an intimate knowledge of the various entities that do people this region in which he enters and, and uh, works. And that is very different from the uh, Lucy Goosey, uh, if I can use that expression, um, approach to opening my mind and uh, receiving whatever comes into it. May, may I oh, say okay. one other thing, Father? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I, uh, I wish to, to uh, in, in terms of experience, point out something else, too. Yes. Uh, in terms of the, the what one might call the shadow, uh, yes. uh, demons yes. and, and their ilk, uh, I happen to be very afraid of them. I am very, they scare Thank the God you are. out of me. Thank but, God you are. Yes. I, but, but I, I, I'm not afraid that they will harm me uh-huh. because of my connection uh-huh. with God uh-huh. and with angels. Yes. That's Good. the only reason that I can, uh, I, I can uh, deal in the areas that I deal in. Ed, could I stop you there and ask you a question which is permanent, uh, pertinent? Of course. You said that you no longer need faith. Uh, uh huh. Now, you, you see where I'm going. I, uh, I, not essentially, but what I said was I, I feel that it's, it's, uh, I, I have absolute trust now. That's, that's right. What, but faith, therefore, in, in, uh, on your lips meant something else other than what I mean by faith. Because obviously, if you do, um, depend on angelic protection and divine protection, you have what, in classical terms, would be called religious faith. Do you understand me? Yes, I do. Um, but but it's not so. Uh, uh, I, have, I have no words to describe this. But the, it is one. You've made several acts of what would be called theological faith throughout your entire discussion of this, and you have a, 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 a certain almost childlike. A dependence on their protection yeah. to preserve you because that's why you venture into this field um, unafraid in that sense. You, are, you have certain fears or, or uh, you, you take care of certain things out of respect for your enemy or for the things that could deceive you. What, what I meant was uh, by that was that I can perceive what, uh, what these things are. They right. are all the, and, and, and in the past, when I was a young man, before I was uh, exposed and imbued and learned to be a professional in the techniques that I used, I did not know what these were. Uh-huh. And uh, I, then I needed what I called, in my classical terms, faith. I had to rely upon a higher power, you know, my God, to protect me. From these dark, from from the darkness. But now yeah. I can see into the darkness. I can shine this light in there and see, aha! 
over here is this, over there is that. Yes, yes, yes. And that's yes. essentially what I mean. No, that, that was enlightenment. You, you still have that dependence on protection, though. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, you see, that, that's the, the... Now, I only want to introduce a thing which I've talked about before, which I, I can never put exactly. It is the supernatural. Uh, the, the supernatural is the, by essence, in, in the Christian tradition and in the Jewish tradition too. But uh, since I'm a Christian, uh, I better speak authoritatively only about that. The, the, this idea of the supernatural is, uh, is disturbing in one sense but consoling in another sense because the Christian idea is that the supernatural itself is totally alien to human nature but has come to human nature to elevate it uh, and therefore to protect it in this uh, in this field, especially in this field, but in the normal field of human behavior too, but it, that is alien to it, in the sense that I myself cannot, of myself, just with my human powers, attain the wisdom I need in order to avoid uh, collision and damage and and uh, harm. Uh, that's the idea of the supernatural in Christianity. Doctor, may I ask you this? Sure. Could Ed's understanding or um, enlightenment, yes. protect him against possession? It could, given merely the words he has used and the phrases he has used and what he has said. I find no trace of the things that betray uh, the innate weakness of vanity or pride or self-reliance. Um, I find a godliness in it, uh, and that is one of the keys to it. Uh, he should be protected against it because the grace of the supernatural grace is there. And all, all I'm doing is saying that uh, that has been with him apparently all along because he, he cited his own career as a young man and then getting into the, the dark corners and getting the light to see uh, the lurking dangers that were there uh, be, to be able to, de to detect an angel of light, which is really the, the shadow itself uh, pretending to, to trying to deceive him. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, he he can do that with impunity. Um, uh, but, but then that would mean that if, to, if I were to be fully and completely uh, thorough in that, in that answer, I'd have to sit down with Ed and say to him, all right, now tell me uh, how you pray and how you think and how you behave and how you live oh. and your morality and stuff. And I have no intention of doing that to Ed because he wouldn't do it to me in public anyway. All right. Um, Ed, uh, do you want to hang on a little bit longer? Uh, it's up, I'm, I'm digging in to Father Martin's time, and uh, I can hang in for another 30 minutes. All right. Why don't we do another, another 30 minutes? Father, or, is that all right with you? That's lovely. All right, good. We will be back, and we will do exactly that next. I'm Mark. Well, all right, back now uh, to Dr. Malachi Martin and uh, Major Ed Dames. And uh, Dr. Martin, yes. is remote viewing something that you would not uh, participate in or as described? Uh, is it something that you feel would have value and something you might even try yourself? Uh, for whatever about trying myself, because I'm not a technician or not, haven't been trained in this, I don't regard it as essentially dangerous. And in fact, uh, I think at this stage, what we should do is uh, sketch out where the discussion has arrived. Um, Major Ed Dames has outlined uh, a very careful and uh, tried and tested um, I'm I, I was going to use the word technique, but he will forgive me if it's not exactly that. And if that is not the exact word, but it's a method of uh, exploring uh, and remote viewing, especially with view to uh, intelligence, military, and I suppose civilian, and also as regards human behavior. Now, and he does, he has pointed out that they have learned by bitter lessons. Uh, that certain types of people, certain characters, uh, uh, are, are simply not fitted to be uh, brought along this way because of the dire results that take place. And he didn't expand on that, and there's no need to. Uh, uh, we can imagine what he, mean, what he means by it. The position of the exorcist uh, where we come in is somebody who has gone off the rails, as it were, somebody who has not merely become frenetic, but does seem to be uh, possessed, as the classical term has it, 
uh, and in his terms it is that the shadow has uh, become completely all powerful over a particular individual and uh, the, the, the simple technique we use is a technique of confrontation uh, between the exorcist and the exorcee, the possessed person, the presumably possessed person, and that's the initial problem to find out, is the person really possessed or is it something else? And the confrontation between the exorcist and the exorcee uh, and an exercise of authority over the shadow and uh, forcing the shadow by the authority of God, of Christ, to depart. That's roughly the area we have covered. Um, and uh, by the way, I, I must ask a simple two question of, of spelling. I don't know how to spell Cytex. Is it Cytex? C I T E X? Yeah. Uh, Father Martin, it's a it's a, uh, a a transliteration of the Greek letter uh, C. Uh, P S I. Psi. Oh, Cytex. And T E X is it? T I T E C H. T C H. All right. And. Uh, uh, Ed, is, is it D-A-M-E-S is the way you spell your name? That's correct. I, I didn't know that. That's all right. I want to sum up because I would like to correspond or to be in contact with you, if I may. Um, and uh, I suppose I'll find it some in California. I'll better find you. I'll, I'll make that connection. And uh, Art will be our middleman. I was going to ask you uh, that uh, yes. perhaps we could corroborate in, in the future. Or is there a, a case that an exorcist case? In the past, that you found intractable or or, or irresolvable, uh, that perhaps my company could turn its attention to. Perhaps there, 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 there may well be, and I think we should uh, talk about that between the two of us uh, outside of the uh, okay. public radio. But the uh, an answer to Art Ad, Bell's question: No, I have no. I'm not. I'm not even cherry about entrusting um, myself to the methods and the technology of use because it seems to me, uh, Major Ed, and I'm speaking as a priest here uh, and as, a, as, a, as, a, as an exorcist, it seems to me that you are overshadowed by a godliness which I can only ascribe to my Savior. Now, I'm using my Christian language and you'll forgive that. But, but ah, it, it, no it, need to forgive that. Yeah, but I, I'm also a simple Christian. So. Yeah, I know. Uh, and, uh, basically, it's a great simplicity. And uh, and there's a whole elaboration of that about the humanity of our Lord Jesus and what he has done and what he does um, and, and uh, the, the the power that he gives and the authority he gives. But that's simply, those are the, the, the details of it all. So, uh, uh, Art, to conclude that, uh, my answer to your question, no. I, I, I would have really, uh, really illimitable trust in... Uh, the methods that uh, Ed, uh, Major Ed James uses and the techniques. I, uh, I uh, have no qualms, whatever. I really have not. I find that remarkable. You both apparently agree on the general nature of the middle ground. With yeah, that middle plateau, we yes. both know. I, I think we've both been there, or are there, in that sense, in the work we do. Do you agree, Ed? Uh, I absolutely do. Many, many Christians, uh, people who would call this program or send me faxes, would say that what Ed is doing is of the devil. They, uh, they would uh, just uh, make uh, Art, may I interrupt you judgment. and say that the head of the Presidential Foreign Intelligence Board, when briefed on the existence of our program, uh, stated, uh, after he went sheet white, that man should not know these things until he dies. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a funny inversion of what... Um, what happened in the garden, according to Genesis, it really is. You know, you shall be as God, uh, as if it was a temptation. But you see, uh, Art, if I could break in there, uh, I, I really do think that this is a charism that has been developed in Ed Dames and his associates, if he has them, who are like him. Um, and it is the work of God, because it does enlighten us as to the shadowy personages, that inhabit the middle plateau and that entrap people so that finally they end up on my doorstep <laughs> in, a, in a pitiable condition. Um, and uh, I remember being approached by some members of the armed forces, uh, let me put it very vaguely, in the 80s, and their complaint was, and Ed will understand this completely better than I do myself even, look, 
we have trained officers in certain techniques and we find that they have now developed symptoms that you describe in your last book about possession. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's been my experience, Father Martin, that those uh, individuals who have taken lives uh, in combat, yes. the more lives that a uh, soldier has taken, uh, there seems to be a, a storage area. That, uh, it's yes. a denial. And when yes. one uh, is uh, uh, by vocation, or uh, by order is uh, partakes of things that are spiritual. All this uh, comes out of the closet, and I have seen soldiers uh, uh, break into pieces and stay broken. Absolutely, uh, because they've taken a human life. And uh, from the from the, could I say this and be understood? Because I, I want to be understood by you. Um, looking at it from the inside. It's logical. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's almost a necessary consequence. Ed, uh, I, I think we really can't do any more than this. Uh, I am surprised at the result that we got between the two of you and pleased by it. And I, I would imagine you are too. I'm very surprised and I'm very pleased. And I've learned so much and I've been enriched by this. I have really, I want to thank you, Ed Dane. This has been uh, nothing but an honor for me, Father Mark. May God will go with you and uh, give you the grace. Ed, my friend, thank you. A pleasure to mine. Uh, Cytex Ed Dames, and uh, as I said, he has promised to uh, join us once again and is going to target himself uh, this Hale-Bopp comet headed our way, and we'll see what uh, Ed has to say about it. All right, um, uh, Dr. Martin, yes. uh, you have a new book. It's That's called right. Windswept House. That's right. What is the central tenet? What were you trying to tell everybody in Windswept House? I was trying to tell them the condition of the present Pope in relation to the papacy. In other words, the book says the following. For some time now, actually for about five to eight years, it's hard to pin it down, there's been a movement amongst the more powerful servants of the papacy, cardinals and bishops, in uh, Europe and in America, to persuade the present Pope to resign and retire, which he can do legally, by the way. The law of the church says that a Pope may resign, and he needs give no reason to anybody on the face of the earth why mm. he resigned. Indeed. Now, uh, there has been pressure on him to resign, and since he turned the age 75, and is now heading, he's in his 77th year, and in very bad health, the pressures are enormous on him, so much so that... Uh, the document they drew up to illustrate their wishes, and they, this document was in his hands towards the end of the 80s uh, and the beginning of the 90s, he has yielded so far to this extent that he's drawn up another document uh, which pertains to some legislation he would like to pass before he dies concerning the health of popes. In other words, supposing a pope becomes a vegetable. Mm -hmm. Supposing he is rendered uh, totally incapable of movement, physical movement. Supposing he goes mad. Supposing there's dementia there. Yes. Uh, so he, he has drawn up this. He has not signed it because he would trap himself if he did, because he'd be giving rules that, rules that should apply to him. However, the pressure on him has been very big to resign. And their motives for doing so is this. They say, we have such problems nowadays that only a more forward-looking, more liberal-minded pope can really collaborate with the forces uh, amongst in human society to stave off disasters. They're talking about two disasters. Uh, they're talking about the what they call the population explosion. We are, what is it, 5.2 billion now. That's right. We're heading, they say, for 7.5 in the year 2030, and so on, so on, so on, so And that's the number one problem. And number two problem is education. The first problem of explosion, uh, they say, can be curbed by abortion, contraception, sterilization. And yes. sterilization is already being used in third world countries, uh, manufactured by Canadian and American companies. Might even add euthanasia. And euthanasia. That's right. Exactly. To deal with what some of the demographers who are heartless, uh, the useless eaters. Little old babies. See, that's right, useless, useless eaters, yeah. Yes, useless eaters. Little babies and old guys like me. But um, I, I say that as a joke. The, the, the last sentence, the last phrase. But now, of course, the present pope 
is absolutely adamant. I mean, you mentioned abortion, contraception, sterilization, adamant, and, yes. and he, he's airborne with the indignation. So they say, but we, all right, you can, you can cavil about abortion, but anyway, contraception, can't we lighten up on that to some degree? Because even the officially blessed form of family limitation by a Roman Catholic, Catholic called natural family planning, implies a certain contraceptive mentality. Certainly. Uh, so that's the difficulty. But he, he will say no. So they say we need somebody who is more receptive. Secondly, then, within the church itself, we do need, I think, today, the modern mind does say, it would be better if a priest had the option of celibacy or the option of marriage. And then thirdly, there is the the phenomenon of our age, one of the big phenomena is the rise of women as such. Feminism on, in the good and the bad sense, because there's a good and a bad sense to everything. And the, the fact is, why shouldn't women be ordained priests? Why should it be all male? Does priesthood depend on testicles? Pardon my language, but that's briefly the argument that comes down. Is biology destiny in this matter? So they say that we need some, we need a forward-looking man who will be young enough and perceptive enough to start moving on these fronts. Because in that case, then we can collaborate with the vast movement outside by very powerful and uh, flourishing men and organizations for the control of food and the better nourishment. So the awful figures today for the malnutrition, uh, and I, I, I forget the actual figures, but it's frightening. It the is. amount of children that are suffering from malnutrition. So... The pressure on him is great for that. He has refused so far, obviously, because he hasn't resigned. I do feel that the pressure has been so great on him, and his health now is so precarious, that it is now 50-50. By the way, I'm not a betting man. As I said to you before, I lost a few dollars on the Yankees. <laughs> My betting is not exactly blessed by God. But the, 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 I do feel that it is now 50-50% possible that within one calendar year we would have another pope. Uh, he may resign or he may die because his health is precarious. He has... Uh, Parkinson's disease, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it is accompanied by episodic dementia uh, in its early stages. Um, uh, but again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not authoritative in this matter, but I'm told this. He has also an osteoporosis, and he breaks things easily if he falls or hits against things. And then he has been operated for cancer. Uh, Father, what you're talking about is sort of a papal version of a living will. Uh, that's right. That's, that, that's really what it is, and you say he will not sign it himself. Well, he may he may finally sign it and then resign. He uh -huh. may. I see. The, the pressure on him is very big. Now, by the way, the pressure is big because it comes not merely from his own people, his own colleagues, as it were, bishops and cardinals. It comes from very powerful organizations who share the same opinion as those colleagues. Or the colleagues share the same opinion. For instance, there's no doubt about it that the, the thinking of the World Wildlife Fund in this matter, beginning with Prince Philip uh, of Edinburgh and go on down along, or of the Ford uh, Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Pew and Draper Funds, they all think the same thing. They're all very keen on controlling the population, and they agree with those who would like to see a change of Pope. And everybody acknowledges the Pope's achievements and his, his work for peace and his compassion. We all know that. But they say we need a younger man now. The book is about that and about the pressures on John Paul. Well, I would like to get your views on it. And to start with, let me ask you, I had no idea such a document existed. Would it not, in a way for him to hold on in, in, in way past the point where this document would have taken effect uh, yeah. had it been signed, uh, for yeah. him to hold on and then sign it at the very end, would that not be, in, in essence, m morally wrong, if not sinful? Well, it would be at least, put it like this, because I must have some reverence for him, Martin, you would understand that it uh, would be reprehensible. Reprehensible. Uh, reprehensible. Uh, what grade of immorality, how far it's venial or mortal, is something else. And I, I find it very hard to decide that in the, in the, in the person of my Pope. Uh, but, uh, and he is my Pope, and I am a priest of his church. And I'm a practicing one. I say Mass every morning and all that. Uh, the usual priest stuff. Um, priest stuff. Uh, well, priest behavior. You know, I don't want to make a big thing out of it, but it's very sacred for me. It's my essence of, course. of my life. Um, but, uh, yes, it would be reprehensible because then he's putting his own personal uh, position 
uh, in preference to the yes. good of the universal church, if the good of the universal church would be served by his resigning. And that's the crucial decision he has to make. And the book actually ends on that crucial note of doubt in his mind. Should he or shouldn't he? So it, it's, the, the book is not an advocacy uh, wasn't an advocacy no. tool for you. You didn't uh, advocate no. that he should sign this and resign. No, no, no. I leave it a pendant. The book ends on a pendant note, and I've been blamed for that. They said, why didn't you decide the issue? I said, well, the issue has not been yet decided by the man who must <laughs> decide it. <laughs> All right, I want to ask you about those three areas, that is population, uh, the option of marriage for priests, and... Uh, um, perhaps the women's movement and uh, uh, their place in the church. We'll be right back. All right, here we go. Back now uh, to Dr. Malachi Martin in Manhattan, where it's getting very late. Uh, welcome back to the show, Doctor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's still early morning. It is. In, well, it is, yes. Um, early morning. It's early morning, and uh, this conversation is so stimulating <laughs> that um, I find it difficult to imagine going to sleep, although I'm sure if you told me to go to sleep, I would do so immediately. <laughs> you know, that lovely, that lovely condition. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's go on. Uh, let us do that. Uh, now, there have been many studies in which rats have been put together in a tight little area. Inevitably, they end up... Uh, killing each other, eating each other alive, uh, behaving very badly indeed. Our world population, though the planet can hold many people, I'm not sure it can support many people, and we have many, many, many people. What is your position on birth control? Well, I'll tell you, Art. Um, first of all, I think that the phrase sustainable development is susceptible of a, of a, of a decent explanation. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Hitler would also use sustainable development in a completely different sense than yes, Stalin would yes, too. Yes. I think we we people can use it in a good sense. As regards uh, birth control or the control of population, I'd rather put it in the general plane. All right. Um, I can in no way sanction the killing of life once it has started in the womb. I cannot, in any sense of the word. Uh, uh, I just uh, I just can't. I can't take that from the point of view of natural law and then from the point of view of the mandate of my Savior as I regard him. Uh, as no, God, no, no abortion at any stage. No abortion at any stage, no, is not justified. Even the extreme cases that one hears of, rape and... Uh, uh, incest? Incest, uh, no, no. There, there's no way I can sanction the killing of a human life. In any sense, that applies to capital punishment as well as everything else, even though I share the indignation that general of the population when somebody is really a, a killer, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, there's this instinct, let's kill him, let's get rid of him, but I, I can't even sanction that. All right, what about those wonderful little birth control pills that if taken uh, regularly uh, as prescribed uh, to 90% yes. or better will prevent birth? Well, they will interfere with, you see, Catholic doctrine is very rigid, and I think will remain so, in spite of the the, 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 the zigzag split switch today. It says that once there's conception, once there's a, a zygote clinging to the endometrial wall of the womb, yes. that's a human soul, even though it's, uh, it's, uh, it's utterly undeveloped. And you can't interfere with that once that's there. Now, most of the abortifacients, most of the pills are abortifacients. They will evacuate that life once started. Uh, that's why, to a certain degree, many Catholics practice uh, some form of blockage, the old pessary idea, mm -hmm. uh, the old condom idea. Or, the, or rhythm. Or the, yeah, or, well, then rhythm is a different thing. Cause that, the, the Catholics, uh, Catholic, a lot of Catholics today, including the authorities, say it's okay if you follow the rhythm of your body and certain moments when the woman is fertile, you avoid. All right, let, let's back away from that and, and move back to blockage. Yes. All right, uh, how do you look at that? Uh, well, blockage, you interfere. You see, the difficulty is this. But here's the Catholic difficulty with that. Uh, and it's a real difficulty. And many Catholics have changed in this point, but it still is a difficulty. If I block the natural performance of the marital act, let's call it that. Yes. Um, that means that I have a contraceptive mentality. Because the Catholic ideal is to be within the limits of nature, 
and the dictates of nature to be open to what God sends. Now, as, for instance, God does send me the power of walking on a precipice and falling down 300 feet to my death on the rocks below if I don't tempt God by doing that because I may lose my balance. But uh, the point I'm making is that he does give us the power of not coming together with my wife, say, uh, when she is in a fertile period, if she has regular uh, menses, by the way. That's another problem altogether. Uh, uh, and many people try to apply the Catholic natural family planning and find out that uh, she, she was irregular. Mm-hmm. And therefore, they conceived. Oh, yes. and I know one family that conceived six children already. It is, nevertheless, though, still a, a sort of a blockage, isn't it? Uh, it is a mentally, point. yes. Is. And actually, I've always thought of the NFP mentality, natural family planning mentality, as a contraceptive mentality because yes. de facto, I am avoiding contraception. I am avoiding conception. There you are. So I mean. You know, between that and the actual contraceptive mentality, which says we shall use a condom or we shall use, uh, you know, the the uh, the, the, the the intrauterine uh, apparatus mm-hmm. or the pills. Mm-hmm. De facto, the, the the intention is the same. However, some moralists and some church authorities would allow you use the uh, natural family planning because it is within the movement of nature. It's within the prescriptions of nature. I don't hold that, but that's merely my personal interpretation. Uh, but I'm rather rigid on this matter. So what is the answer? Uh, Art, don't laugh at me when I say it. Don't do it. <laughs> it's don't, hard. Just don't do it. Uh, abstention. Abstention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. There are many, uh, Father, who said that the reason that Catholicism has this view is because the church wants more Catholics. Yes, that, that, that was an old shibboleth against the church. But actually, uh, I, I, I've never found a trace of that. Now, I've passed through all the echelons of training, uh, philosophy, theology, and papal service, and that never enters into it. It's never that. It's the horror of interfering with an act which is, uh, of itself, a natural entity, and uh, then uh, I've never seen any place, by the way, in any of the theoreticians or the theologians or in the books or in the lectures. And I passed through it all. I spent 18 years training before they allowed me to preach a sermon. I've never found a trace of that mentality officially. Now, it may be that somebody said, well, let's have as many babies as we can, pal. Well, we did talk about politics earlier. Yes, we did. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. Well, that's Ben Trovato, as they say, that's a well-chosen cho- remark. But it's 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 never. No pope has ever said that, and therefore we will increase and multiply and have more Catholics than dominate the 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 the, the, the population of the world. I've not found that. It's, but it's an old shibboleth, chiefly because uh, Catholics used to have orphanages. And uh, with pregnant, young pregnant women who are unmarried, they would uh, adopt the child. Yes. And uh, there, has been many, there have been many abuses in that regard, by the way. There was a recent 60-minute uh, program on that, which was dreadfully uh, uh, distressing, uh, the lengths to which they went in order to get the babies that were uh, conceived illegitimately, yes. as they used to say in those days. Uh, so that's where uh, I stand on the matter. I do not think that any invasion of that serves finally the glory of God. Then if you were Pope, yes. uh, you would resist, as this Pope has, any, any real change in that area? I would, Ed. I would. Uh, I would, uh, Art. I would indeed. Uh, I would do something else, though more positive. I would set about a different sex ed program than Catholic... Catholic bishops have allowed in America and in Canada. In what sense? Well, you see, the sex ed program, if you examine it nakedly, uh, to, uh, not to pun, by the way, examine it as it is, it's uh, a program that stimulates sexual excitement and interest. Oh? Yeah, it's not educational. Uh, and then if you turn to the, you know, Catholic couples today in most dioceses in America must go through what they call Cana conferences. They're called Cana because Cana was the marriage feast at which Jesus functioned at the beginning of his preaching in the Gospels. And um, 
the kind of conference that's supposed to uh, uh, enlighten the 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 the, 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 fiancés, the the engaged couples as to their obligations. But again, it has taken in this country to a large extent a sexual turn, uh, and uh, it doesn't educate because I think that the one faculty we have, the sexual power, the faculty, uh, requires great education especially today when we've passed through the swinging 70s and the swinging 80s oh, yes. and the AIDS-ridden uh, uh, 90s. <laughs> so, so we need education. So I would change all that. I'd make sure we had a, another sex ed attitude completely. And I would not ask children to experiment with bananas and carrots, which sure. they do. So your, your attitude is basically boils down to just don't do it. Just don't do it, but educate the human being to know that you haven't got to do it all the time and when you do it it must be done within a reasoned existence. You must be able to afford the child and um, you must be able to afford the education uh, and all the other human considerations that make a responsible citizen. Um, that's asking a lot of, it is. Uh, it of is. a person indeed. It is. I, I an awful lot and there are going to be accidents along the way and violations but we have remedies for those two. All right. Uh, Very traditional indeed. All right. Um, yes, the, it is, Art. Yes. All right. Let us see uh, if you are also traditional in the area of marriage for priests. Yes. Now, you've been a priest a very long time. Father. I have, since 1954. Um, have you found the battle with the flesh to be a difficult one, or did you early on come to a, um, an understanding and, and are at rest with it? Art, I must be awfully frank on this point, because otherwise uh, I wouldn't be happy Please with do. myself. Please do. Um, the battle with the flesh stops when the last nail is put in your coffin, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> that's when it stops. <laughs> I'm sure that's correct. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, I know it's that way. Now, difficulty or uh, easement in this matter is, uh, on the one hand, subjective, and on the other hand, objective. It's subjective in the sense that a lot goes into it. Your early background, your nature, mm -hmm. um, uh, your character, the examples you've had around you, your early habits, the way you're trained. For instance, let me tell you this much, that in Ireland of my day, I became a, a Jesuit at the age of 18. I never dated anybody. I never went to a dance in my life. Mm. We had no such thing as co-education at all. We had separation of the sexes, and it was, we didn't look on it as separation of the sexes. It was the, the natural way we all behaved. It was the ambient in which we lived. We had parties at Christmas and Easter and birthdays in which we all uh, uh, were present, male and female, young boys and young girls. But th there was a regimentation or a, a rule of life then which governed everything, the clothes you wore and the way you looked and the way you touched. And, of course, we were naughty at times. There's no doubt about that. And there was masturbation, of course. And there was mutual petting when, when my, our parents weren't looking and things like that. But nothing grave and nothing sustained and certainly nothing uh, permanent at all. It was a different thing completely. Now, has it been easy? Oh, Ed, I'm 76, you know. And um, I must tell you that uh, the early part of my life, it, there were struggles. There's no doubt about that. Uh, thank God they ended as they did. About the age of 65 or 70, it, uh, things cleared up in the sense that <laughs> it became easier yes. to be reflective about it, uh, not because I lost interest in, 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 in the, the male and female aspect of life, but because other things came in that sure. fascinated me m more readily. Uh, and uh, You nevertheless remember the days of struggle. Oh, Lord, do I? Listen, remember, I have my days of struggle. Uh, then never with, ceases it. Okay, uh, with, uh, with respect, then, uh, to marriage for priests as yes. an option. Well, I'll tell you, if life goes on as it's going at the present moment, I do not see... Well, uh, let me explain that. If the pressures continue to mount on this matter, and they are mounting every year, especially in America yes. and Canada. If they continue to mount, I cannot see the authorities escaping the necessity of allowing the option of marriage. Well, why do I say that? Because 
If I took a poll to, tomorrow of the 280 bishops in the U.S., in the United States of America, and of the, I don't know how many bishops there are in Canada, I suppose there are about 20 or 30 or 40, a majority would say, make it optional today. And they have said so. They have said so. Rome doesn't take a lot of polls, does it? Uh, well, actually, Rome does, but uh, pretends it doesn't. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yes, they take polls. So ah. they, they've got a man in 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 in, uh, in Washington, the Pope's man, Cacce Villan is his name. He's, a, he's an archbishop, and uh, he he is continually taking polls on all these questions. Really, Rome's pollster. Oh yes, Rome's pollster, <laughs> and here, Rome has its pollster in every country. And they take polls on the point, uh, and they don't always listen to the polls, I say, they don't even pretend they take them, but they do. And they have this index of leading Catholic indicators, which <laughs> indicate the condition of Catholicism, <laughs> and it's published, uh, they finally are beginning to publish that. Now, what do I, they, this is in regards to the actual mounting pressures, there are big pressures mounting, and there are underlying faults in the pressure. For instance, it is said by many priests, and many bishops too stupidly by the way they say well if we did this we'd have less uh, deviancy less pedophilia mm -hmm. which is of course is garbage psychologically any psychologist or any psychiatrist will tell you that there's more deviancy amongst married people than amongst celibates mm -hmm. so it, it has no bearing on it whatever um, deviancy is deviancy and there's more of it in married people apparently than amongst the so-called bachelors or celibate crowd of men and women. So that despite the, uh, the presses reporting on it because of a very sensational subject, right. uh, the, the actual amount of it you're saying is much less than in the average or in the regular much, population. Much, much, much less. What is mounting is this idea that it's a human right which the church has interfered with for a long time and shouldn't any longer. But it is the pressures, the political, socio, cultural and political pressures that are changing this. Now, will the church yield on it? I think the pressures are mounting in such a way that in certain regions, say Latin America, the church may waive the rule it has of celibacy. It hmm. may well. What do I think? Oh, I think it's going to be a net loss. No, I was, uh, that was going to be my next question, yes. a net loss for all of those in the church. Yes, because the, 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 uh, I know it's anecdotal to tell you about it, but I was a U.S. chaplain for the U.S. Air Force and oh. with paratroopers in Turkey for a period of my life. And I used to, we used to go on long trips to the radar domes that the USA maintained around the Black Sea listening to the Soviet broadcast. And it was the time when uh, there was great competition about space oh, yes. and the missile development. And I remember there were long trips, and the, the men, the officers who drove me, always called it an 18-beer trip or a 30-beer 30 30 beer trip. We had 30 cans of beer because Turkey was terribly hot in the summer. Oh, yes. Uh, and, uh, but I remember talking to them, and uh, the chief chaplain with us in Inchilik, we were stationed in Inchilik, the, uh, the base there in Turkey, southern Turkey, southeastern Turkey. Um, they, uh, they, uh, the, the chief chaplain was, uh, uh, Woody. He was a Protestant chaplain, a very decent fellow, married with children, yes. and a very decent man, and very good to me. I was a minor chaplain. And I was a temporary chaplain, by the way. But I remember the men used to say to me, you know, they said, Father, look, having made a confession to me, uh, made, the, made the confessions in the car traveling around, uh, if, if, if you were like Woody, if you had a wife and went home at night to your wife and children, we wouldn't tell you all these things. We couldn't. We wouldn't. We wouldn't trust you in the same way. It's not that we distrust Woody. We think he's a great guy. But uh, and some of his his own people, the Protestants in the in the fourth year, uh, have a great love for him. But they haven't got the same approach, the same intimacy with him as we have with you, because we know that you are ours. You yeah. belong to us in a special way. And uh, I was only a parish priest temporarily and in various parts of my life, because I was generally in scholarly work or diplomatic work or something like that, or teaching. But the times I was, the close, the close, the, the, the degree of closeness between a pastor and his people, behaving himself, hearing their confessions, serving them, baptizing them, and shriving them when they're sinful, or say they're sinful, and helping them to die in God, mm -hmm. the closeness is something unbelievable, uh, Arch, it really is. And it's all, I think, influenced by the fact that you are totally at their disposal. So then there would be a degree of loss in that area. There would be a degree of loss in that area. Now, by the way, look, we, there are certain sections of the Catholic Church, like the Maronite Rite, which is the, the Catholics of Lebanon, 
who have always been married. And then there are Greek, Greek, the Greek Orthodox churches and the Russian Orthodox churches, they, their priests are, can be married. Their bishops, no, but they allow their priests marry. And they have a very magnificent priestly tradition, you know? So there's, a, this is a human law. Just has developed in the West uh, to be the universal norm. Doctor, hold it right there. Sure. We'll be right back to you, top of the hour. Now, uh, back to Dr. Malachi Martin. Dr. Martin, uh, maybe this will set it off properly. I just got a fax. It says, Art, there is no question that there have been horrible injustices toward women throughout history. But it seems today as if the feminists are so determined to achieve equality with men that they do not care whether they concurrently bring down the very institutions they are trying to achieve equality in. How do you feel about that? I'll tell you, Ed, uh, Arch, the first thing that strikes me is this, um, and I've often asked uh, women, very powerful women I know who are leaders in, say there's a group called the Women's uh, Leadership Forum, and I know all the leaders very well personally. Mm -hmm. I've eaten with them and walked with them and talked with them and discussed things and wobbled with them in a friendly, loving fashion. I've always asked them, uh, when, they, when they happen to use the expression, who wants to be equal to a man? Uh, and uh, if I want to be equal to you, it means that I regard you as superior. Uh-huh. Uh, so, I mean, that's right, that's right. The mentality I started with, first of all, then, of course, there comes the fact we must acknowledge the dire effects of male chauvinism. Take medicine alone, Art. I mean, medicine has been created on the male body and for male ailments. And uh, you've, uh, I, this is brought home to me very, very sharply when I had open heart surgery a couple of years ago. And I said to the doctor, uh, uh, Subramanian, a marvelous Indian doctor in Lenoxville Hospital in New York, um, is it the same operation for women? And he started laughing. He said, no, no, we in this was invented for the male body. Yes. We have to adapt it for the female body. And this applies to the whole gamut of health. Uh, it is really men's ailments that were envisaged by men. No, it really, it really is true. And if you look at the budgets allocated for study of problems disproportionately, they're allocated to men. Mm -mm. You're right there. And then there's a big push to, to get a, a study of, uh, of uh, breast cancer. And, but it's, it's mainly women pushing it. It wasn't done by the academic community. Mm -hmm. So there has been injustice there. And then there's no doubt about it in, 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 in uh, finance and in industry uh, and in the armed forces and uh, in general in public life. Women were given second place in that sense. They were mm -hmm. considered to be the weaker vessel and just uh, the proper place was at home. Uh, um, having babies and cooking and taking care of the house and the family. Now, there's nothing wrong with all that. The only thing was that the time came when women were needed in the workforce and when women felt they should go into the workforce. There's a different force blowing today and it has also entered into the church. And there's the difficulty. Now, there are some women, just a few, very highly placed in the Vatican as regards decision-making. And... Uh, between you and me and the Holy Spirit, asked if I want something from uh, John Paul II, and I've, at times I've wanted something for other people, obviously, yes. I always go to one of those women. Oh, uh, why? Because they have a direct manner, they go straight to the horse's mouth, and they usually get what we ask for. I see. Because they simply have that, they have this power of communication. The men are all tied up with their egos. And they're not. Well, um... So it, it's a good sign. Now, the difficulty is when you come to the question of ordination. Yes. That's a different question completely. And I must say, it's a trap into which I've seen so many so-called eminent uh, bishops and theologians fall uh, uh, that they finally you reduce them to saying, just because you have testicles, you can become a priest. <laughs> you know, it, it comes down to that. Because you ask them why uh, there was one man. To give you an example of the difficulty, and it does illustrate for, your, for our listeners, there's one bishop who was very adamant, but he was an Anglican bishop, but a very celibate man and a very good bishop, by the way, he's in Canada. And um, he finally was splutteringly reduced to saying that, no, uh, unless you're male, you can't be a priest. And that determines your ability to become a priest. And of course, which is a dreadful conclusion, because then it reduces the whole question of priesthood to 
to physical things. And there's nothing wrong with the physical things, except one would have thought it was a, a higher reason that you became a priest. Well, what is the higher reason? In other words, why may a woman not be a priest? Well, I'll tell you why uh, a woman, a female, God has arranged, as the church says, that women do not become priests. It's for the very same reason, and I'm not really dodging the question, I'm giving you the reason, it's a, a very profound reason, and let's hope the time allows us to at least delve into it. Sure. It's this. For instance, the Christianity says, God the Son became man. Christianity also says, by implication, God the Father could not have become man, and God the Holy Ghost could not have become man. And the reason is this, it's the nature of God, the nature of the Trinity. The son can be generated, can be born. The father was never born, and the, son, the Holy Ghost was never born. Their natures, their, 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 person, their personalities are such that they, being born in any sense doesn't fit in with their personalities. Whereas uh, it does with the son. He's the son. He's generated by his father and his mother, usually. Now, the basic reason is this, that within creation as a Catholic sees it traditionally uh, only a man pictures reflects reproduces the function that Jesus chiefly filled namely as high priest a uh, woman does something else she actually is the source of eternity she is the source of uh, future generations uh, she is the source of love uh, and uh, marital bonding, but she is she is not she doesn't reproduce at all. Her function is not to reproduce the functions that Christ had as high priest. Uh, it's 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 as simple as that, and it's as as uh, as complicated as that. It's a long uh, uh, consideration, and. Um, there's a, a deep theological reason buried there, and it's very hard to give it in a few words, but that's the essence of it, that only a male reproduce, and not because he's a male, but because he's a son, he's generated. And the son, Jesus himself, was generated by the Father in eternity, and he was generated in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit. Um, he reproduces that condition that origin, that personality of the Son, and therefore he can, he can reproduce, therefore, the functions of that Son as high priest. That's, that's the essence of the theology of priesthood, and of course it doesn't apply to women. Women have a, a greater, in the eyes of, the, of, of Christian theology, they have a more noble function. They, they conceive. You're a very traditional priest, aren't you? Yes, Art, I am. I'm dyed uh, in the wool in that. It has informed my entire existence and corrected the cannibalism of my nature. And uh, I'm a natural bum, and uh, I'm uh, also a natural barbarian, I think. So you must have a great sympathy, then, for the Pope uh, who is being assaulted by the liberals. Yes, I am. Uh, in, but, see, uh, I do know that there's this inconsistency in my Pope, which I regret very much, but he has it, and I have to bow in front of consistencies. Most of our characters are inconsistency, are inconsistent, and his inconsistency is as follows. That on questions of, say, uh, abortion, contraception, homosexuality, genetic experiments, uh, anything like that, he is absolutely adamant. Absolutely adamant. Mm -hmm. On everything else, he's liberal. He really is liberal. By the way, if you go to the Holy Father and say to him, Holy Father, may I commit an abortion? He, will, he gets airborne. You know, sparks fly. Sure. And same thing with contraception. Same thing with homosexuality. Same thing with divorce and remarriage. No, sir, nothing like that. But if you say to him, Holy Father, I would like to see women priests, he becomes pathetic. And he will say to you, I wish I had the power. There's no sudden, he doesn't become airborne, he's not protesting, but he wished he had. And by the way, in the year 1995, there was a meeting of 15,000 altar servers, you know those people that serve the masses and the churches, of uh, in St. Peter's Square, 15,000 of them, and the Pope came out to address them. And he came out on the famous balcony of St. Peter's. 
Now, there were, by the way, there were 4,000 girl servers there amongst the 15,000. And he knew that. And he said to them in his speech, which was a very enthusiastic speech, he said, I hope that some of you or the majority of you will one day celebrate Mass at the altar. Oh so and he knew what he was talking about. In many areas, then, he is altogether too liberal for you. Well, too liberal... No, he, 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 I see, I regard liberalism, the way he's liberal, as fatal errors. I regard it. But listen, I'm a little man. No wonder they didn't make me Pope. I couldn't manage it hard. But so, I mean, I can't judge him. Just from my poor little mind, it is very dangerous what he has attempted to do outside of sexual morality. It is very dangerous. He has endangered the the uh, the integrity of his organization, not of the Catholic faith, but the organization itself is in danger due to his liberalism as regards uh, sharing are. things with other religions. So then, given an opportunity, you would urge him to resign. Ah, ah. That is, that's a judgment art I'd be afraid to make because, <laughs> I'm, as I say, I'm just a poor little fella. I'm on really on, happy. on the air, doctor, or off the air? Uh, <laughs> Both. I, I, I really have no... Uh, I would, by the way, I don't think... You see, I'm looking at his replacement, and the replacements are awful in my book. The possible well, replacement... You see, there is now a race. Uh, anybody coming from Rome nowadays who tells you the truth and who speaks your Roman language of what they're talking about, they're all talking about one thing and one thing only, uh, the conclave. Mm. And you know what that means. Yes. It means they're lining up for the next pope. There, there, there's no doubt about it. This is the evening of John Paul II's papacy. We all know it. And therefore, the, the papabile, as they call them, the popable ones, have come to the fore. And none of them are to my liking. May I run a theory of life by you, Doctor? Please do. Please do. Um, I love to hear it. And I, I, I bet it applies to your situation as well as mine. And it is that um, I watch the change. I'm only 51. Uh -huh. Good You're 76. That's great. And um, I, I, even even at 51, I look at the changes that are going on in society, mm -hmm. and I have sort of come to the conclusion that as we get older, mm -hmm. and society continues to change and change and change, yes. by the time we're ready to go, or yes. near ready to go, yes. we sort of look up and say, Lord... These people are out of their minds. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. I'm ready but to that, go. But that, that is a sentiment that starts as a tiny voice about my age. I'm uh, sure when I get to the end of the 70s, I'll be saying, uh, Lord, look, uh, please give me a ticket. You know, have mercy on us all. I, I suppose it's inevitable because so many of your friends go, so many things change, that you feel that you're no longer really at home. Do you understand me? Uh, yes, I, yeah, I certainly do. Little pieces of you have departed. My parents are gone. My closest friends are gone. My brothers are gone, three of them. And it's not that I go around moaning and groaning. I don't. You know me too. I understand. Friends. But I do feel that a lot of me has departed with them and is waiting for me. Yes. You know what I mean? We'll all get together again. But I agree with you fully about the, the way life changes. And no doubt up there, the church is the way you recall it. Yes. <laughs> of course. All That's right. I, I would like to begin to take some calls here, if we okay. might. Oh, Lots of people want to talk to you. So, East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Malachi Martin. Hi. Hello there. No, I guess I didn't push the right button. First time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Uh, Malachi Martin. Hi. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, you're on the air. Hello. Yes, I'm on. Am I on the air? Yes, you yes. are. Turn your radio off. Oh, okay. Better do that right Sorry. away. Hold That's on. the difficulty. All right. Uh, if you have your yes, radio on, um, my radio is off. Where are, Where are you coming from? Uh, San Diego, California. A long way away. Okay, apparently. <laughs> all right. Yes. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, it's fascinating. To I'm a little nervous here. Um, it's okay. fascinating. Don't be nervous at all. We're all nervous from that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say this is. Dr. Uh, Malachi Martin uh, reminds me of some detective story that he's in New York in the middle of the night, and he's mysterious and very fascinating. And uh, I mean that as a compliment, though. <laughs> yeah. So it just reminds me out of something out of an old detective novel or something. Hmm. But um, Well, well interesting. <laughs> but what I wanted to ask was, um, would you guess who you think would be the next pope, and I have ventured a guess uh, 
or a possible candidate of the Archbishop of Milan, uh, Carlo M. Martini, and I was wondering if you were familiar with him. Yes, I know Carlo Martini. He was rector of the house, the last house in which I lived, although oh. he wasn't rector when I was there. Oh, okay. At the, at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. He right. was a Jesuit, a very brilliant man, by the way, and good at his, uh, his uh, biblical uh, profession as well as in cardinaling. He has become a front runner for the papacy. Oh, he's on the side of, the, of Rome then. Oh, yeah. Well, per se. <laughs> he, he, he's, 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 although he's Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, he's, right. the, he's one of the front runners. So uh, he could possibly be the, the next pope? He could possibly be elected the next pope. Wow, that's fascinating. Yep. And I was wondering, um, it was interesting to me, you've been talking about feminism. Yes. Um, and it was interesting to me that the new version of the Psalms yes. uh, for the, the Catholic Americans yes. was disapproved by Rome. Is this a sign of what you were talking about? Well, you see, what happened was that the, 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 the translators of the, new catechism, of the new version of the Psalms decided to, exp to, to be inclusivist, and therefore they wiped out any his or, or her, his, right. his or him. Uh, right. That's ridiculous. It, it goes to extraordinary lengths. And, uh -huh. and the use of the word man was ruled out. I and, see. You know, and, and human even is avoided because the word man is in it. And right. At, at the demands of many feminists. And really, English becomes re-emasculated as a language. You know what I mean? Right. I understand. Does. I understand. Gen yeah. Gender... Uh, Gender neutral. Gender neutral. Uh, there's no such thing. We're not gender neutral. You know? Right. <laughs> I know Hungarian is and Gaelic. Oh, right. <laughs> my Gaelic, like my natural, my, my, my native tongue Gaelic is, can be also right. gender neutral. Right. But that doesn't mean they don't cease to be chauvinists. The Irish and the Hungarians are terrible male chauvinists. Right, right. <laughs> well, it was an honor to talk to you, and, and thank you for your time. Thank, thank you for your uh, call. Uh, okay, bye. And take care. Uh, so, sure. uh, Father, take Take a rest, a few moments. We'll break here at the bottom of the hour and come back and dive into these phone lines. Lovely. All ready. right. Uh, my guest is Dr. Malachi Martin, and I guess I'm going all over the place here with titles, uh, and so be it, I guess. Doctor, our uh, coverage is worldwide. We're heard uh, worldwide, and the following question is from David in New Zealand. Yes. Sent by fax. Dr. Martin, yes. a person whom I trust while he was, quote, out of his body, end quote, attempted to enter the secret archives of the Vatican. He said he was repelled by two angels at the archives door and was forced to return to his body. Can you comment on it? Can you tell us who is allowed to enter and read these archives? The archives are now under the care of a man called the Bibliothecarius, the papal librarian or the Vatican librarian. And it's a position similar to the Librarian of Congress. It's a very honorific job, and it's an onerous job. He actually must sign uh, a permission for you to enter the secret archives. And in order to get that permission, you have to have a qualification, of course. You have to be a historian or a researcher uh, on an authorized mission. And you have to uh, know definitively what you want to get, because there's so much there. And you must know what you're looking for. And you may then get permission to do so. Now, once you get permission, though, it's carte blanche. You, they give you full facilities oh. and uh, a full easement in your work there. Uh, but it's a difficult thing to get just right off. You can't get it by simply showing up one day and saying, I'm, I'm so and so, I'm Malachi Martin, I want to enter the secret archives. No, there must be, a, and usually if it's a priest, he must have a letter from his bishop or from the rector of the institute to which he belongs, the university, an academy, or whatever it is, or a theologate, or a philosopher, or a, a seminary of some kind or other. In other words, they insist on very closely monitoring the identity of who enters. And it, it has to be so, because there are invaluable things there, and they've had terrible robberies there. People oh, they did I trust, and came in, and they walked away with uh, very valuable manuscripts, you know, and they were eventually caught one way or the other. Uh, you would think that a place you wouldn't want to steal, uh, if, if there was any place where you wouldn't want to steal, that would be that would be the place. Well, there was a steal. case in my time there where a very very rich Brazilian uh, wanted a certain document referring back to a papal prescription in the 16th century or the 17th century, and he paid somebody. And uh, I arranged the ID and everything else, so they would be be accepted. 
and he did get in and he did attempt to steal it. Mm, uh, he was mm, caught. Mm, mm. Uh, there are such things as that. But there are invaluable things there and things that have never been unearthed. Ah, uh, one can only wonder. Uh, yeah, one can only wonder. You wonder, uh, really. Uh, there are seven miles of archives beneath seven the Vatican. Miles. Seven miles. Seven miles. Yes, actually, it's, wow. done, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing, Art. When you go through it, as according as you go, the light starts and the light behind you dies out. Oh, my. The light follows you wherever you go. That is uh, incredible. Uh, it's, it's, and it's air-conditioned and... You know, it's it's maintained a uh, very careful environment. Because yes, because they have papyrus there, they have ancient books that can fall to pieces merely by being handled. I understand. All right, first time caller line, you're on the air with Doctor uh, Martin. Hi. Doctor Martin. Yes, Art, yes. it's an honor and a privilege. Okay. <laughs> Where are you? Where are you? I'm in I'm incorporated Fort Lauderdale, Florida. All right. Yes. I have six questions, but I'll narrow it down uh, to four if at all possible. Okay. Um, I foresee the, um, the the way I perceive the world as as a, a an apartheid and genocide corporate uh, um, in America as a corporate American society. Um, how do you perceive this being in the near future? Oh, I think. I'll tell you what I think. The, the structure of the near future of the world, I, I will not see it, I think, unless God prolongs my age to 120 or something like that. A prediction of it. <laughs> the, the idea of a national government, of a nation state, is disappearing. Okay. We're going to have regional authorities. And we're already slipping into that with our NAFTA and uh, our European Union. Uh, we're slipping into that already. And even within a vast community such as we have in the United States, which one, what is it, 250 people, 250 million people, I can foresee the day when, for instance, uh, uh, there'll be certain black or, or white enclave and accepted by people as such. Because, you see, I think we're coming to the stage, lady, and I hope it doesn't frighten you no. or shock you, we're coming to the stage that laws will be made affecting our salaries, our vacations, our education, our birth and death, our medicine, uh, our politics. Laws will be made by more than Americans. It won't be Congress. It won't be the Senate, merely. Okay. It'll be foreigners. Okay. I mean, non-Americans. Okay. I think we're at that stage of regional... Yeah, I got, I, I, I got the point. You got the point? Yeah, I, I understand it quite clearly. That that is um, very factual. Absolutely. The the other question is um, my ability um, to predict yes. um, without you know the personification of predictions. Yes. Um, like this um, plane that just went down. Um, now they're saying it was a laser. I've always uh, I always um, had the uh, the assumption I would say you know yes. Yes. Uh, that it was. It, am I going into a middle? plateau without checks and balances there or well, how, do you, how do I receive I know. I'll tell you my advice to you is this. Mm -hmm. My advice to you is this. If you have that ability and it comes up unbidden, do you understand me? Yes. That's one thing. If you were to use it to guide your life or to guide others' lives in a very active interventionist way, then you need guidance. How do I get that? You get a very good confessor a very good priest okay. who knows his stuff, who has what they call discernment of spirits, because uh, well, what is your first name? Liza. Uh, Liza. Liza, you have to, you see, it's discernment of spirits, what spirits are moving you. Mm -hmm. Once you exercise those gifts of the middle plateau, mm -hmm. then you need somebody to say, no, that's, that's the wrong instinct. Yes, because sometimes I don't know and I get really stressed out. You must get a very, very saintly confessor. But now, money, mummification, you know, is... Like, you know, after dying, it mummification, you yes. know, it's like being mummied for, yes, yes, you know, yes, instead yes. of being buried in the ground, is yes, that a sin? Yes. Well, mummification, you, are you in favor of that? Yes. Well, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Uh, technically speaking, religiously speaking, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Okay. But be very careful because it's a great gift can be used, as we saw with the Major Ed Dames uh, in his work, but it also can uh, provide your undoing. But not necessarily so. It's a gift of God. You can use it for God's glory. Okay. I give you peace, love, joy, and happiness. Thank you Same so much. Same to you. Thank uh, you. Eliza. Very interesting call. Wasn't this? Yes. Wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hello, where are you calling from? Uh, Tucson, Arizona. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Mike. Uh, Father Martin, Hi. fascinating. I have a question for you. 
Yes, Mike. Suppose there were an uh, extraterrestrial visit to the Earth that was yes. that was so dramatic that it couldn't be denied. Yes. How should Christians feel? Afraid or? No. No. And, uh, Mike, I must I, I invoke a privilege here. Um, uh, let, how will I put this? It is um, uh, dangerous for the mind to pursue the whole idea of uh, beings in an, on another planet. It is dangerous to the mind for the moment because we haven't we haven't got any um, physical basis for it. Really, right. nothing concrete. Um, Christians should look on it immediately as the presence of beings who also, if they're if they're beings with a mind and a will have been saved also by the blood of Jesus. Isn't sin just here on earth? The, in the no, because the earth? he said, if Jesus said, all power is given me in the heavens and on earth. But the devil's confined to the earth, right? The devil for the moment is confined to the earth, but that doesn't mean he would be confined only to the earth. And I'm sure that if we had colonies on the far side of the moon, or in Mars, anyway, the far side of the moon, that the devil could be active there. Yes. All right. Because, uh, Father, uh, let me interject here. Yes. As you know, there have been recent revelations here and in Europe yes. with regard to, at least at the microbial stage, the discovery of life on Mars. That's right. There's, there's a strong possibility that there was microbic life at that level. There was life and, on and And kind of like with where there's smoke, there's fire, That's we right. may eventually discover that there is life elsewhere. It's we not may. unreasonable. We may, well, I'd, I'll tell you, my personal belief, if you want to ask me, you can call me crazy, a crazy Irishman. I firmly believe there is life in other galaxies. And then... Not in our galaxy. If, if yes, but, and we, we must presume that that life may have a technology that one day may allow them to come and see us. Absolutely. And, by the way, the, uh, listen, you and I know, we all know, but we don't know much more than that. We do know that we have exhausted the means of energy. We have fossil fuel, and we have got nuclear energy. It's so a we fine, know finite supply. Yeah, for, uh, number one, it's finite. And number two, we know that for what we want to do, travel, galaxy travel, we need another source of energy. Yes, sir. And we will get it. We will get it. So then Christians should not necessarily cower down oh, at no. the possibility. Oh, no, 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 no. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hello. Uh, good morning. This is Tim in San Diego. Hi, Tim. Good morning, Jim. Uh, Dr. Martin, you impressed me as a, as a, as a wise person. Well, yeah. thank you very much. It's a, it's a compliment, really. Uh, well, know. so that's why I'd like to ask you a question about, you know, choosing a religion to put your faith in. You know? Yes. Someone like me, I've... I've never really been able to to do that because there's so many different religions that I know. that claim to be the one way. I know. I so know. how how would you advise someone like myself? I'll tell you. Did you ever kneel down and pray? Yes, I have. Well, I'll tell you. Morning or night, once a day. It's a simple thing, and it's not a trick. It's a, it's just simply it's a it's a habit that can produce results. Kneel down and. Address God and say, look, you want me as your creature to adore you and serve you on earth and give you glory. Send me somebody. Send me the means of knowing that. Ask him. Ask him and he will send it. As sure as I'm speaking to you. Okay. That's a but good you answer. Must, you must do it as a child. You must do it trustfully. You must do it knowing that he is your father, finally. What if you have not done it, uh, as this gentleman is not a child, uh, yes. and wants to know now? Same process? Same process. Uh, but be childlike. Not, uh, you must be childlike in your trust, as you would with somebody who loves you dearly. Ask, ask him as a father, in other words. Ask him as a father and say, you want me to give you glory. You want me to serve you. I feel the urge. You've given me this instinct. Now show me how, because I do not know how. Okay, thank you very much. Thank That's you. That's what I would say, Mike. All right. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with uh, Dr. Martin. Hi. Fantastic. Great show. Thank you. Where are you, sir? I am in Sacramento. All right. Yes. Uh, Father. Yes. 
Yes, um, I'm interested in finding out your opinion on um, the revelations from uh, Father Don Dobby. Yes, um, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. Uh, unless you, uh, I, I'm sorry, I've interrupted you. Oh, no, I was just also going to ask you uh, about Fatima and some of the other Marian apparitions as well. Yes. Well, let me tell you about uh, Father Gobi, as I call him, Gobi sure. or Gobi. Uh, look, um, uh, the Virgin Mary, from the Gospels and from what we know of her, is a woman of very little words. She's a woman of a lot of actions, yeah. but very little words. And there is, no, there is no way on the face of God's earth that she could have said all those words that Father Gobi puts on her lips in his books. And I guess if, if Father Gobi was asked, I'm sure he would say to you, if he were asked, no. What I've done is I have clothed her thoughts uh, in human words to make them more intelligible. Uh-huh. You understand me? So that not everything is... Uh, is Iprissima Verba, as they say in Latin, the very words of Our Lady. You know, I don't she, it would take a lifetime for her to say all that to Father Gobi. Sure. For him to copy it down, you know, from, from her lips, number one. Number two, as regards Fatima, he is very sound on Fatima, um, and the Fatima prediction is being worked out at the present moment to our cost. But in the end, in the end, as she said herself to the children, my say, my immaculate heart will triumph. Now, I understand that um, through, I believe his name is Father Fox. He's, he's um, yes, very Matthew Fox. Uh, I saw him on a program recently, and he was saying that he got a message to go to Sister Lucy's um, convent. convent, and yes. that the, uh, con- the consecration of, uh, of Russia to uh, the heart um, yes. of Mary had been accepted in 1984, and that he expected that the year 2000, would bring about um, at least the beginning of an incredible new period. Well, I'll tell you, uh, here's the point that uh, what Lucy did say, and has said more than once, is this, that although the consecration hasn't been done as, it, as she asked it to be done, what the Pope did in 1984 in St. Peter's Square will suffice. That's what she said. That's ah. what Lucy said. And that... But it is quite clear to you and to me and to anybody looking at it that Russia has not been converted. Sure. That, that hasn't even started. Uh, sh- true enough, since the disappearance of the USSR and the, uh, and the, the rise of Russia as a separate nation with the other uh, former nations uh, in the, what they call the, the, the CIS, uh, the, the Con- Confederation of Independent States, the, the, um, the, the uh, 4,000 churches have been opened, reopened, they were closed by the Bolsheviks. Yeah, but there is no religious revival in Russia. Oh, you're you're so correct, caller. Thank you. Absolutely uh, no religious revival. Uh, Father, I think you would be very surprised. I was in Russia last year. Yes. And other than in name, I was unable to detect the differences, uh, other than a few surface differences in Russia at all. To me, it was still just the same thing. You betcha. Same thing. Just more corruption, uh, more immorality, more brutality. And more real, low-grade villainy. <laughs> that's a that's a good, accurate description. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with uh, Dr. Martin. Hello. Uh, yes, Dr. Martin, sir. Yes, I I wanted to ask a question. Uh, I wanted to get your opinion on uh, Dante's The Inferno. Yes. Uh, are you familiar with that? I am indeed. I have it, and I read it every day of my life. Do you? Okay, it's, it's a very interesting book, man. It, uh, it brought a lot of questions upon me about... Uh, I'm sure it did, but he has views of his own, and it's, it's beautifully done. Yeah. Where, where are you calling? I'm calling from Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, sorry. Memphis, Tennessee. Yes, sir. Yes, by the way, I wanted to mention, Art Bell, you got a great show going on, man. I just recently started listening to it. It's Thank the you. best show on the face of this earth. Yeah, yeah it's pretty good. <laughs> it's Thank pretty you. good. It really is. Nobody has done this thing. Only Art Bell. Stop, stop. Yeah. All right, and anything else you want to ask, Colin? No, I just wanted to ask about the Dante. I just wanted it to... It is very enlightening, and I'll tell you something, Carla, too. Um, if, you, if you do read... Uh, do you read in the Italian or the English? I read in the English. Okay, it doesn't matter. In double Dutch, it's, it's, it's just as good. If you read it and cultivate him, uh, you'll find that you, you begin to get great instruction from it. Do you understand me? And right, enlightenment. Right. And encouragement, too. Right. The enlightenment above all. You begin to understand human frailty and human goodness and God's justice and that sort of business, you know. Right. Besides, it's very beautiful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's You've... just very beautiful. Yeah, this guy, he, he got pretty freaked out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he got pretty freaked out. That's right. <laughs> I don't know how you would explain something like that. I guess he done the best job he could. 
Yeah, well, it, it, it's heavy. I think the, the 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 thing that always struck me about Dante was his relationship to Be- Beatrice, the woman he fell in love with. Right. He never really got to know, yeah. and he made her his guide. And uh, there's a famous picture. Do you know it? Of he meeting her on the bridge of size. Right, right. I remember that. And he did meet her on the bridge of size, holding his heart. Right. And uh, he obviously was smitten deeply yeah. with a, a deep love of her. He was a Republican, by the way. It was. A very active Republican in, in, in his native uh, country. Yeah, it was a pretty great book. Uh, book I just recently checked it out. Uh, it is. All right, caller, I've got to interrupt. We're headed toward the top of the hour here. Well, all right, here we go. Back to Father Martin. A question for you, Father, and then we'll go back to Jones. Um, is it true, uh, this is a fact, that the greatest collection of astrology manuals are at the Vatican, and why? Well, it is because the formation of the Vatican Library was started very early on before most other libraries were begun in Europe and in the world Mm -hmm. and the popes were avid collectors collectors of everything number one and number two when books and astrology on astrology were published in countries in Europe mainly the local bishops sent copies of them to 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 Rome to be vetted Ah. and they went into uh, a certain section and by the way there's a section, it's going to make you laugh out, but it's true, there's a section there which is for pornography. And you know, the, uh, what? We, we theologians were over there, we used to refer to it as hell. Um, it is there, um, why? Uh, why what? Why is it there? Well, because they were again sent for, for, for censorship, for vetting, and they have a principle, don't destroy books there, they don't burn books easily. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I, I, I assume that one gets, when one gets permission to visit these areas, it's not the most visited of them. No, it's not. It's not, actually. And <laughs> it's part of that seven miles of underground uh, stuff I mentioned. Uh-huh. That's, re- that is, uh, that's remarkable. Yes. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hi. Oh, Father Martin, I'm so glad to talk to you. This is Beverly from Chicago. I met you when you were on your book. Yes, before. Beverly, I remember. Well, how are you? Beverly, you're going to have to speak up good and loud. You're kind of weak here. Okay, yes, Father, I wanted to ask you, yes. they found Typhus's tomb in Jerusalem. Does that have anything, do you think, to do with Revelation? Well, it may or may not. It's not very clear as a sign of Revelation, Beverly. It really isn't. Uh, they, they, they found, you're referring to the tomb of Typhus, are you? Typhus. Uh, Typhus. Oh, it does. It, it, it's a confirmation that the man existed because a hundred years ago, many scholars were denying that Caiaphas ever existed. And they were denying that he was the, uh, one of the high priests. Now this comes to confirm it. And it just illustrates something, Beverly, which is very funny, and which is a backward procedure. The older we get, and the further we are removed from the sources of the Bible, the more confirmation we're getting. For instance, it's only nowadays we found out a stone on which the name of Pontius Pilate was written. There were scholars, and their books are still on the shelves, in the last century and the beginning of this century, who denied there was ever such a man. I see. So, I mean, it does. It confirms that. But it doesn't give us much more light about Caiaphas. The, the only light we have is really from the Gospel. Well, I thought in the Gospel of Christ saying, and you shall see me, Caiaphas, returning in glory, or whatever they... Yes. Well, he, well, what he said was this. When Caiaphas, I said to him, listen, I... I, I impose a note on you as a Jew, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a priest. Tell me, do you claim to be the Son of God? Yes. And he said, yes, I am the Son of God. And you will see the Son of Man, meaning himself, yes. returning on the clouds of heaven. That's referring to, uh, he was telling Caiaphas, look, you know from the Bible, from your Bible, from the book of Daniel, you know well, the Son of Man comes in judgment on the nations. I'm telling you, I'm that man. Yes. Do you understand me? Yes. Whether Caiaphas listened or not is something else. Only God can judge him. Is it true also, Father, there should be a sign in the sky? Oh, I, I would say so. Uh, she said, is it true there would be a sign in the sky? And you certainly alluded to that with keep of your course. eyes on the sky. <laughs> of course. There will be a sign in the sky. All right. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hello. Hey, how's it going, Art? How are you doing? Okay. Tony from uh, KBEG Country. In Los Angeles. Got it. Yes, sir. Hey, this is a great show. Hi, uh, uh, Dr. Malachi. Hi there. How are you? What's on your mind? Oh, well, uh, 
No, I got to come all goodwill. Yeah, I got to come for uh, you and Art. All right, uh, he deserves. Um, I well, I've been uh, watching. Uh, I've been watched by people for a little while, and and you know they try to plug me as paranoid schizophrenic. Yes, and um, that's just recent. That's all recent. Um, but I've seen. You know, I've been there and done that as far as seeing unidentified. UFOs and yes. sightings of unnatural origins. Yes. And uh, it's hard for me to follow up on and participate as much and as interesting as you are, uh, Dr. Malachi. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, as much as I'd like to with these, with some of the things that you do say. Yes. Uh, but let me, inter uh, if I may, uh, these, I've been watched at, uh, during UFO events by military jet uh, planes, I assume, that are also in the area. Yes. And I can't, uh, for the life of me, uh, describe stuff like this to people without them thinking I'm a paranoid schizophrenic. And, uh, you know, I just kind of wanted to quick comment on that. And then i got a question for Art. All right. Well, I'll tell you, the only comment I've got to make in is this. Look, put your trust in God, and... Uh, it doesn't really matter what men say, provided you don't break the law. Then they have to intervene. And I'm sure you do not break the law. Uh, but I, we all find in life that at a certain moment you have to be independent of adversary comment on your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't do a thing. You'd be afraid. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with uh, Dr. Martin. Hi. Hi, Father Malachi Martin. This yes, is, sir. This is Ed from Madison, Wisconsin calling. Ed, I'm uh, uh, glad to hear your voice. What's on your mind? The Bible says that Jesus fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights, and Moses also before him. That's right. And many saints have done so in the Christian tradition. That's and right. And for myself, in the last year, uh, for 20 days, I've fasted twice. Wow. And I would highly recommend it to anyone. And so I have two questions for you. One, what is your opinion of the spiritual practice of fasting? And two, uh, why has the church shied away from recommending fasting? All right. Well, number one, Christ himself recommended fasting very much both by his example as you, you have alleged, he just fasted for four days before he started his work. And also when he spoke about dealing with the devil and dealing with evil, prayer and fasting he recommended. And we've all found, we have all found in the past, that fasting is a very salutary thing. It, it does sharpen the wits, and it does make you more attentive to spiritual things. Why the church has shied away from it? Well, here I have to, to appear uh, to be an old curmudgeon and to have the grumbling and grousy. The reason is this, that a lot of clerics, a lot of prelates, a lot of bishops, a lot of cardinals have lost the spirit of Christianity. And they themselves like a good square meal four times a day, and they think everybody else should have it if they can afford it. So it's, it's a lack of faith, believe you me, because fasting is a part of salvation. Does it not uh, induce uh, I itself a uh, kind of an altered state? Yes, it does. It does, if you exaggerate. But it's a very good thing. All right. even, even people who are training for football and swimming, they, they fast in their own way. Oh, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hi. Good morning, Dr. Martin. Good morning, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm calling about... I have a dilemma here because uh, I've had a problem with the priest in the past yeah. with uh, sexual uh, molestation. Oh, boy. Were you molested? Yes, oh, but uh, this was after, I'm a handicapped person, and uh, this happened after I was 21. Uh -huh. Well, I'm calling for Albuquerque, New Mexico, and yes, um, they just recently had a thing that for people to call in that needed help. And a friend of mine, um, he he's a pathological liar, and and I don't know, he steals, and then uh, he's just really confusing. And when I told him about my problem. We used to live together, and then he kicked me out, and he went to the the church, and his law, his lover is a lawyer, and they went and sued and won, and he told me, he goes, well, I already know, like, I'm going to go to hell, so it don't matter anyway, and when I tried to convince the sister Casey that he's looking over the case, um about my situation, she said, well, because you're over 21, when it happened, there's nothing we could do. Oh, Get yeah. my friend. She, she's not correct. You can. By the way, try and contact Father John Fitzgerald at the Queen of Heaven Church on Claremont Avenue. 
John Fitzgerald. Father John Fitzgerald. Fitz, we call him. He's a very good priest. He's at the Queen of Heaven Church on Claremont Avenue, and he will help you. Tell him that you spoke to Malachi Martin. Okay, well, what do I do about my friend? That I can't believe he did this. And when I called the, to give information about what he had done, they said, well, the case has been settled and closed. Well, has it been settled and closed? Well, I uh, presume so, because he's got a lot of money, and he's taken a lot of trips, and he's bought a new car. Well, and I wouldn't check how that thing, but I think Father Fix will give you a very good direction in the matter. He's a very good, just, holy priest. He really is. All right. Okay, well, and the name again is what? John Fitzgerald at John the Queen Fitzgerald. of Heaven Church. Yes. All right, uh, so there you go. East on Claremont of, Avenue. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Father Mark. Hi. Hi, all right. I'm calling from New Orleans. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm not receiving you on the radio right now. Oh. Hello, Father. Hello, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, sure. If I perceive plausible, I mean, if, you know, if I, if, I, if I receive plausible, intelligent thoughts, should I perceive that as divine intervention? If you, if you receive plausible what? Intelligent thoughts, you know. But thoughts, T H O U G H. Oh, thoughts. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Should, you, should I perceive that as divine intervention? Yes, on one or two conditions. First of all, that the, the thoughts don't recommend you to do something sinful. Number one, mm -hmm. and number two, that they don't bring disturbance to your soul; they bring you peace. Right. If they do that, if they, if they fulfill those two conditions, then you can go ahead. One more thing: it, if I'm not baptized, does that mean my soul is doomed? No, it does not, but it means you've got a job of work to do, right. because uh, baptism is necessary for salvation, if you, and you know about it, and okay. you can't say, I didn't know about it. Well, so you should go to a good priest and ask his advice. Thank you very much. All okay. right, thank you. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with uh, uh, Dr. Martin. Hi. Hi. Turn your radio off, please. Okay. All right, where are you calling from? Uh, Riverside, California. All right, you're on the air. Yeah, I just want to ask, uh, Doctor. Yes, uh, uh, are you familiar with the First Timothy uh, four uh, four three? What, what it says about the the you was talking about the, now the church will allow uh, the priest to get married. Well, at the present moment, the church doesn't allow priests get married, but there is a proposal that uh, they should be allowed. It isn't yet the law. Oh, but are you familiar with First Timothy four or three? Uh, uh, with with I don't get familiar with what? Are you familiar with with uh, First Timothy four? Well, First three? Timothy, yes, yes. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Well, what about it? What it says that uh, 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 they forbidding uh, the the Bishop. priest to get married. Paul? Yes, uh, that that is there, all right, but uh, the the. The, uh, the, we're not talking about marriage for bishops. We're talking about marriage for priests when we speak about priestly marriage. Ah, West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hi. Oh, good. I'm glad I got through. How you doing, Art? Fine, sir. Where are you? Um, Joe from Santa Monica. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, you spoke of Satan and Lucifer on the, the show last time as yes. being two different beings. And yes. I was wondering which one is the devil and what's the difference? Actually, the difference is this. Uh, by the way... Uh, if you were sitting in a room with your family, how many people in your family? Five? But yes, there are. Five. Okay. There are five <laughs> people in your family, and if you're all sitting in a room, and I say to you, how many people are in this room? You say one, two, three, four, five, six. You count the bodies. Isn't that right? Right. Now, with angels and spirits, they haven't got a body, so how do you count them? <laughs> By their being? Their function. Ah. They do. Okay. Now, the angels... Uh, 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 were created to function in this on this earth for man's benefit. Uh -huh. uh, one third of them apparently revolted against that and said, oh, "We will not serve," and they were condemned to hell. Uh -huh. They became demons. Their leader was a, uh, a being whose name was always called Lucifer, the light bearer, right, son of the dawn. His edicon, his sidekick, was a, uh, a, a, a demon whose name has traditionally been called. Satan, and Satan is merely a Hebrew or Semitic term meaning adversary, Satan. Satan is an adversary in okay. modern Hebrew. 
Oh, just one thing. Don't cut me off. I have one more thing to say. All right, by the way, keep going. Sorry. Okay. So, so Lucifer is, is the chief angel, and his okay. sign is the scorpion. Uh-huh. The sign of Satan is the serpent. Okay. That's the distinction. But we know, ex as in exorcisms, there are two very distinct beings. Very distinct beings. In fact, every demon is distinct from every other demon, but it's by their functions. You know. So Lucifer sent his, his sidekick to, to, to bring the apple to Eve. Yes, he did. I he understand. directed all that. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hi. Hello. Good day, Art. Good day, Dr. Martin. Good day, My name is Joan. Where are you, Joan? I'm in uh, San Fernando Valley outside Los Angeles. Very good. Okay. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Martin, yes. um, with that lovely name, Malachi, yes. pronounced in the Gaelic, you yes. obviously have heard of the prophecies of St. Malachi. I'm oh, sure I have. Mm -hmm. Art, the prophecies of St. Malachi are a little like, not like Nostradamus, but not quite. That's right. They're, they're always sufficiently clear to interest you, but sufficiently vague to puzzle you. Yes, and they're only on the popes. That's right. Yes. Well, I understand that there's, according to the reading of them, there's only room for two more popes. That, but the, the prophecies themselves don't exclude the fact that there might be popes in between. That's, the, that's again, the hazardous uh, character of predictions like this. Uh -huh. It doesn't mean there couldn't be two more popes, three more popes in between. But the last two popes will be called Gloria Olivi and Petrus Romanus. Uh -huh. but we don't know in between, unfortunately. That's the, the terrible thing about oracles and predictions, that they, they tell you a lot, but they leave you puzzled. Now, uh, uh, can I get a, a copy of those anywhere, Doctor? Oh, yes. If, 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 if I had an address, I'd send you a copy. They're, they're being, being published in ordinary pamphlet form. Okay, both of you, I'm sorry. I've got to interrupt. Think okay. about that one. We'll pick it up after the break. Back now to Dr. Martin. And, uh, Doctor, are you there? Sure. Uh, let me ask you a little bit about your constitution. For 76 years old, I'd like to know how you do it. Uh, just now, first of all, I like doing it. That's the last. That well, really that's important. Long. That's well, important. very important because it makes it so much easier. Uh, otherwise, you could be tired and bored and you could to fall asleep or want some food. Or, yeah, you know, but are, are, are you sure that you're not sent a little secret potion from the Vatican that keeps you going <laughs> like this? <laughs> No, no. I wish there were such a secret potion. It would make my bones, my creaking bones, much <laughs> as creaky as they are. No, I think it's sheer interest, and I have a good constitution. I've only had really one bad illness in my life. I was open-heart surgery when the old uh, heart started giving trouble and saying, Hey, I need some help. And um, otherwise, though, life has been uneventful. Um, I still have my hair and my teeth, and that's our business, you know. No big secret, then, no. No, no big, no, no big secret at all. Um, no big secret at all. Really, I wish I could find something and say, oh, it was this, it was that. No, I have nothing art I can communicate at all except good luck with my health and God's blessing. Uh, well, you certainly have that. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Good morning. This is me, Joan, again? Yes, it is. Uh huh. Well, I've won up on the doctor. I'm 81. <laughs> oh, you are? Oh, uh -huh. good. But I'm always glad to greet somebody like that because they can tell me something about it. <laughs> well, uh, to come back to the subject we were talking about, Dr. Yes, uh, yes. First of all, regarding the, the book, I, I have the address you gave the last time, and I'll send a stamped addressed envelope and ask you to give me the information. Would you book. do that? And I, I, will, I will get it to you, I yes. promise you. But secondly, uh, you've bl completely blown my theory about, about the, the last two popes. My, what I came to the conclusion of, some time ago, it was considered that this was going to be the end of the world. I know, they thought that. But then they thought it was going to be the end of the Catholic Church. That's right. But my theory is completely different, and in view of various thoughts, and I think in view of your recent book, yeah. my theory was that perhaps the papacy would change back to what it was, Bishop of Rome and first among equals. Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's, of course, we're dealing now with the imponderable, John, you realize. But... Uh, my feeling is roughly the same, except that I add in what Our Lady said at Garabandal, in which I believe, by the way, in that vision, that appearance she made in Spain, in Garabandal, the town of Garabandal, which is a part of, uh, it's near Santander in Spain, um, in which she said that uh, the present Holy Father, the present Pope, is the last Pope of these Catholic times. Uh -huh. Not the last Pope of all times. No. No. But the implication is that these Catholic times are coming to an end. Yes. And the Catholic times meant a period of time, roughly since the year 400 A.D., 325 to be exact, but 400 A.D., 
when Catholicism grew to be very important and integral to Western civilization, in fact, it created a Western civilization. Mm -hmm. That period is coming to an end because this yeah. civilization is no longer Christian and is the church itself is being marginalized yeah. and uh, sent into a new form of the catacombs. Now, the, the Pope was always first among equals, but he always had that little extra thing called the Petrine privilege. And yes. that, I, that I think is going to stay. Yes. Uh, but a modified form of papal power is going to come through because of the fact that the political power, the socio-political power of the papacy is going to be diminished even further. Mm -hmm. And actually, don't you and I know, today yes. it's a liability to be a Catholic. Absolutely, yes. Well, of course, that would be a help with, with joining, uh, having friends with the Orthodox. It would, that's of course. That's one it, difference. It would, of course. Although that's a long way away to uh -huh. judge by the Orthodox. They don't want to have, they don't want to hear or tell of us. Hmm. Uh -huh. Bartholomew of, of the Patriarch of Constantinople and Alexei of Moscow couldn't be more contemptuous. Uh -huh. uh, but the, the present Pope is always, is almost groveling with them in the good sense of the word. But they... They sort of walked by and they sort of said, oh, no, you've got to change everything. We don't hear about the papacy. Oh. <laughs> it's quite a distance away. Unless, unless keeping our eyes in the skies, we see the sign and, and there's uh, the Queen of Heaven comes. It's, it's, you know, at that stage, at the age of 81 and my age of 76, we shouldn't really care about it, John, because I think that it's, it yeah. will be after our time, darling. You know? <laughs> we'll be playing hop, uh, looking down, <laughs> I hope. Dear lady, thank you. We've got to leave you. Thank you. Bye-bye, and thank you, doctor. God bless you. Take care. Um, before I forget it, before yes. it gets away from me, you've got a lot of books out, latest being Windswept House. That's right. A double-day book. People can get that. Any uh, normal bookstore. Any normal bookstore, huh? And if they want to order it, they can order it at 1-800-323-9872. Wait a minute. Uh, one eight hundred seven two. One eight hundred three two three nine eight seven two. Nine eight seven two. Now, yes. uh, everybody's going to be driving me crazy to have a way to contact you. Well, I'll tell you. Let them write to the following address, Art. All right. Two one seven East Sixty Sixth Street, New York, New York one zero zero two one. All right. Say it again slower. Uh, two one seven. Yes. East 66th Street, right. New York, New York, 10021. 10021. That will get me. If I can get it, they can get it. So <laughs> they've got it. All right, uh, Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hi. Hi, Dr. Martin. Um, yes, my question is, do you, do you feel that the Ark of the Covenant is some, <laughs> contained somewhere a few miles beneath the Vatican? Well, I'll tell you, now? the Ark of the Covenant did disappear when Jerusalem was captured by the Romans in 132 A.D. Now, and it appears there's, a, there's an arch. The, the Romans had a habit when they had a big victory, they, create, they built an archway, you know. And uh, the Arch of Titus is in Rome, and on the Arch of Titus there is a picture, a drawing of the Ark of the Covenant. So far, so good. There is now a story, a legend, an idea, and in fact somebody has written a novel about it, that actually the Ark survived into Christian times and is now finally in the possession of the Vatican down in the secret archives. Uh -huh. Now, I've never been through all the archives, but I know the Vatican very well. And if there was such a thing as the Ark of the Covenant there, I would know about it. I really would, because I'm a, I was one of the privileged uh, scholars of Judaism in the Vatican itself. Yeah. So, I, so it is not there. You I don't us. think it is. And the Ark of the Covenant was made of wood anyway. And, of course, it could always last that amount of time. And it may well be there. There is another legend, or not legend, but a tradition, which says that it was uh, tied up and uh, bound carefully and then uh, buried beneath the Tiber itself. We don't know. I'll tell you one thing. If God wants us to find the Ark of the Covenant, we will find it. Yes. Do you understand right. me? Yes, sir. But it did, it probably did go to Rome if it's on the Arch of Titus. It's mm -hmm. pictured there as amongst the spoils of war. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Can I ask you one more question? Yes. Is this, is this a, a false report that the, the, the Vatican is surrounded by Masonic lodges and the Vatican officials are actually uh, controlled by the Mason Freemasonry no, no, doctrine? That, that is false. That is really false. It's, a, it's a, no such thing. There are Masons. 
members of the Lodge are members of the Vatican. There's no doubt about that, just as several bishops in the United States are Freemasons. Uh, doctor, let me ask you yes. about something, and that is Egypt and yes. the pyramids and the Sphinx. Yes. Uh, many people feel we are on the verge of discovery with regard to chambers below the Sphinx. Yes, I'm told this. I'm told this, yes. Uh, I don't know much about it because I remember climbing the Sphinx and climbing the pyramids and entering the pyramids, but I, I, I know nothing about the present excavations there. What is your sense of those um, monuments? They are marvelous monuments to the religious instinct of man. The, that the entire civilization of Pharaonic Egypt, which is a marvelous civilization, and started way back 3,000 years before Christ, by the way, contemporaneously with the, with the Chinese civilization in 3,000, 4,000 uh, B.C., that that could attain, could be built on the idea of death. Everything centered around dying and immortality yes. in, the, in, the, in the pharaonic religion. And uh, it was an amazing achievement. And the Book of the Dead, one of their fam more famous books, is full of this very sublime truth. And uh, they had a beautiful civilization. It also has its, had its warts, as we say. You know, it had its faults. So they knew some things before they knew. Exactly. They did. And <laughs> there, there are some mobs. Do you know that we have love stories and love letters from pharaonic uh, officials that are, would touch your heart today? And they were written, they were written before Abraham. Wow. Uh, I mean, fantastic beauty. Uh, fantastic beauty. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hi. Yes, hello. Um, hello, ma'am. My name is Eugenia from St. Louis, Missouri. Yes, ma'am. It's a lovely Greek name, Eugenia. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I'm Irish, and um, my, as a matter of fact, my father took our family on a two-week trip to Ireland, and he died at the airport. Um, oh, no. Yes, okay. but it was a big 12-hour delay, and he died after the 12 hours right there at the airport. And a the Shannon Airport? Yeah, and a priest was right there to um, give him a blessing and everything. So, Well, ma'am, that's where God, from the time that he was conceived, that's yeah. where God destined him to die. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, I also believe in Garabandal. Yes, ma'am. And um, so do I. The warning and the miracle. Yes. The two. warning, I study and study about it, but I cannot quite figure out what it really is going to be. Well, nobody can, but oh. it's, it's this. It is, it's not a warning, really. No. It's, there's no English word for it, but oh. it's, it's a putting on notice. You know when you say, I'll put you on notice that your rent will be, have to be paid by Monday or something. Oh. To put, it, put somebody on notice. That's what it means by the warning. It's avertimiento. In, in, in Spanish and Italian, to avert, to alert, to put on notice. Oh. And it's a putting on notice that God exists. And the promise is that when that sign appears, yeah. it will be visible to every human being existing at that moment on this globe, yeah. and that everybody will know their relationship to God. It doesn't mean they're going to believe in it. Yeah. It doesn't mean that they're going to be justified, that they will go to heaven if they die. No, it just oh. means they will know exactly where they stand in their conscience. So in other words, not to worry, you'll know it when you see it. That's right. The miracle, I would like to ask. Could the, the miracle... Mir come? miracle is something else. That's going to be a permanent sign. Okay. It, it wouldn't be the rapture, would it? No, 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 no. You well, don't think no, that? The rapture is something totally different. And at Fatima, Lucia has even said that communism will um, eventually take over the whole world. It will be all over the whole world. Well, no, she didn't say that. Uh, oh. uh, what she said was the errors of Marxism. Oh. The errors. And she and talked about an annihilation of nation. Well, unfortunately, but truly, that is also predicted in the third secret of Fatima. Oh. Father, are we in this country making those errors now? No, 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 we're not. But they, we're indulging in some of them. The main error was sheer materialism. The denial of the supernatural, denial of heaven, denial of, of sin, denial of evil, and the just living for this, for this world. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the main error. There also was the social error of Marxism, and we're not committing that yet anyway. All right, good. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hi. Hi, uh, Dr. Martin. Yes, uh, I believe you mentioned before the break that you did believe that um, the Earth would be hit by a comet or something like that. Say that again. 
Uh, the, that the Earth would not be hit by a comet, you would say. Yes, yes. I, I don't. I, I don't believe that God is going to destroy it with a comet like that. No. Okay. Uh, I, my I, question I, is: In yeah. Revelations, it states that the uh, the Earth would be impacted by a star, and that a mountain would fall into the sea. Uh, I was wondering what your belief on those might be, and, and well, that, that they that, might that, be associated. That, with that. that could happen. It would, wouldn't necessarily destroy the, the, the destroy the uh, the Earth as as we know it. I think that. Several predictions, which I trust, but who am I? Uh, several predictions I trust speak about a part of the continent being washed away by the sea, by a tsunami. Uh-huh. Uh, and I don't like to think about that because of the people that would suffer and the loss of lives and the children and the animals and the destruction and the pain. But it's within the realm. It's within the realm, yes. Mm -hmm. It is within the realm. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Hi. Yes, hello, Dr. Martin. This hello. Is Ron Smith from Los Angeles. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, could you speak specifically about the role that the Vatican is going to play in the emerging New World Order? Uh, that's a very interesting question. It, it, it'll take a longer time than we have at our disposal, but the essentials can be said very briefly. The New World Order finally, essentially, and as it is now is and will be increasingly, is a new arrangement of global finances. And it's a new control and direction of the flow of capital and the flow of capital goods. Uh, have you noticed, for instance, that Russia and China have both been invited by the President of the United States, uh, President Clinton, to uh, join the, uh, the World Trade Organization? And both Russia and China have recently become members of the Bureau of International Settlements, which is in Basel, and which is in membership members are always just the heads of their central banks in every big industrial country. And uh, in other words, the, the, the world, the, the church in Europe, based in Europe and spread all over the world, is going to be involved in a, an economic and a financial and a monetary and fiscal system where it has very little liberty. And therefore, the ancient liberty of the Roman church to finance itself, to have its own bank, and to have its own funds is going to be severely restricted. Number one. Number two, there are laws now, for instance, in the European Union, which is going to unite every nation from Galway Bay to Vladivostok in one uh, union, com uh, monetary union as well as political union, finally. They have laws that are strictly anti-Catholic. For instance, every constituent member of that union must have laws permitting abortion and financing it. I see. And they also want laws permitting homosexual marriages. So from your assessment, is the New World Order a good or a bad thing? I'll tell you, it's obviously a stage in the development of human civilization that we can't avert, we can't stop. Do you know what I mean? It's coming whether we like it or not. Uh, if it's money, that aspect of it is very nearly in place already. It, it is. That my point always, uh, Art, is to say that th don't speak about the coming New World Order. It is here. It is here. If it's, it is money, here. If, it's if it's finances, it's here now, it's and here. the the political changes will follow on. They will, and the pressure now is not from below. You see, up to this in our century and previous to this, the pressure was from below, from nations rising up in revolutions and in in popular uprisings. The pressure now is from on top, from those who guide the finances mm -hmm. and say, look, in order to manage this financial system, which is now globalist and manages every country's finances. Uh, in order to do that, we have to have certain rules. Nation state, uh, nation states, and the idea of nationalist governments and local parliaments, that's all got to be diminished. We're going to have regional authorities. And then ultimately global. Obviously, Art. Uh, well, I mean, but uh, the, to answer this gentleman, it, it's not a, it's, whether it's good or bad, it's here. <laughs> you know? And well, I, I think it's probably good and bad, like most that's everything else. Like everything human, Art, it has its negative. Another place that I was blessed to visit was communist China. Ah. They're, they're going through uh, economic changes now that are astounding, even, Dizzying. Dizzying. Even, even a little frightening. Uh, and inevitably, whether they like it or not, the political changes will follow. So you, of might, course. you might mark that down as good, but then, of course, we can see many negative aspects of it. That's right. That's right. But you see, that's the, that's, it's a human situation. It's not paradisiacal. Uh, exactly. Yes, uh, Father, we are at the end of yet another program. It was it just it just went 
Bonnie. It, it, it went like a flash of lightning. It really did. And, and I, I want to thank you so much for having me on. Well, giving me that privilege. It is a privilege. I want to be sure to be able to have you back on again. Well, you can. Art, you can. <laughs> Just call. Establish it. And it will be done. I shall do it, my friend. And I want to thank you. And, uh, Art, I, I keep you in my prayers in a good, benign sense of the word. It's not that I'm praying for you as a sinner. I'm praying for you as a, as a brother and as a fellow traveler on this, on this, you know, Christians used to speak about being in via, being on the road. And those who are dead are in termino, in the, <laughs> they've reached the end. But we are in via, you and I. And as long as we're associated, uh, you have my blessing and my prayers and my goodwill. Doctor, thank you. God bless you, Art.